live. Let me know in the chat if you can hear me okay. I'm getting all sorts of errors from YouTube Studio. I think I was on the wrong internet before and it's just not updated itself. Gotta see how this works. It's currently saying no data, so that's always encouraging. And we're live. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> what happened to Frozen? Yeah, I am. Um, she's just having a, you know, some people get stressed, you know, and they, they just have their moments. Hope everybody had a good uh, Christmas or holiday period, depending on how you or whether you celebrate. It feels like a long time since I've done a stream. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Not done enough talking recently. All right. Yeah, let me just share that on Discord. Hey, Manu. Julia. Oswin. Hey. Arjun. Hey, how's everyone doing? All right, so today we're going to be having a bit of fun with some winter landscapes, or at least we're going to try. Um, should be should be fairly doable. I want to learn how to use the uh, the accumulate node because I have not really used it yet. Um, I haven't really used Blender for like a week properly, maybe even two weeks. Like I've been uh, like working through other people's files and like finding. Um, fixes and things for people but not actually working on blender stuff so yeah just gonna get back into the flow of it today all right that's me done and i remember to update blender as well awesome Cool, so I don't even know if there's any like new new nodes. So let, let me just first see what's going on with that. Dima, hey from Ukraine, welcome. Um, what have we got? Uh, so I guess I'm mainly interested in, wait, what am I interested in? Mesh, utilities. So the accumulate field, we're gonna play with this one. I think this one's gonna be a bit of fun. And, uh, I did see a patch coming through for Boolean maths. I don't know if that's not, no, that's not done yet. Let me bring up that patch so you can see which I'm talking about. So there's gonna be an, there's gonna be an integer math node as well, but there's also gonna be this, potentially, there's actually no reviewers at the moment. So mystery pancake, I guess we probably want hands to have a look at this, but uh, yeah, basically adding the sort of inverted things like not and not all and these ones imply is that two returns true unless the first input is true and the second is false interesting so that should be that should be useful anyway because at the moment you kind of have to stack boolean nodes to get like different lots of not and Things like that. And, uh, all right. So, accumulate what we've got in here. We've got edge angle, it's a new one. Or maybe not, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, mesh island, I've not really used this one yet, but I do know about it. Um, so what can we use edge angle for? Let me just throw in something like a monkey. So you know how uh, people want to do like the limiting where you get smoothing. So if we get like a sh set shape smooth and everything gets smoothed, right? But you can do something like an edge angle with a compare node and just find out like, oh, where is this gonna be? Um, where is the angle greater than, or wait, less than, less than some angle, right? And now, oh, this is in radians, so small numbers. So now you can set like your smoothing limit using that edge angle node, so that's very useful. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, using it for the GeoNodes project. It's actually, I've started adding a cube each time because my like my default start file is completely empty. And it's like, oh, now I need something to hold geometry nodes. So I'm always adding a cube. Uh, right, all right. Um, I need to actually work out how this accumulate node works because the language on it is pretty technical, which I like. I like that it's not like, um, it's not dumbed down the language, which I think is like one problem that I really don't like about Houdini is how they kind of make the language artist friendly, uh, which kind of makes it meaningless, like the freaking mountain node. Like just make a node and call it what it is. You know? So I like that they've called this like leading and trailing. And if you do want to see like a proper video on how this works, check out Johnny Matthews YouTube channel because he made the node and he made a couple of videos about it. Let me just bring that up here, Johnny. Johnny Matthews Blender. So I can just share the accumulate node directly. He's done five videos on this node now. Let me just share that first one. So that's in the chat about his node. I know that my, my chat is like slightly ahead of the video, so it'll make sense when we get to it. Um, so yeah, he's made a bunch of videos, five videos on this node specifically. He made it so he knows it very well. Um, we're just gonna kind of feel our way through though. So I'm gonna start off with a line just so I can actually have a look at what's going on with a viewer node. I know I never use viewer nodes, but we're gonna find out what goes on here. All right. So right now the value is one that's coming in here. And that basically means that for each point, wait, so what's the difference? Okay. So starting at the top of the value or starting at zero and then your step size is the value. So there we go. Um, so that's the difference between those two. And this value is your, essentially your step size, is that right? But this can be this can be a field, right? So if we put in like a random value, then each one of these steps is going to be random sized. And it just depends whether we start at zero with trailing or start at one with leading. So hey Riaz. Oh Riaz, it looks like you're still on uh, moderator duty, so if there are any bots, feel free to kick them. Um, the Melody Creator. Hey, do you think that geometry nodes is harder to learn than shading? Um, that's tricky to answer. Um, yes, I would say it is harder to learn than shading because shading, you don't need to ever think about geometry. Shading is just like, oh, you, you have this kind of infinite space and you can set colors to be in different value ranges. Whereas in geometry nodes, you do have to be a, kind of at least slightly cognizant of the fact that you're working on geometry and things are evaluated at the geometry positions. Um, oh yeah, Riaz, no worries. Uh, Kenji, would you go on the Andrew Price podcast if you could? Um, no, I wouldn't. I don't think I've got anything to say. <laughs> you know, like the William Langdon, the Wh William Langdon one, right? That kid who went on. Like props to him because that's probably quite a, a scary thing to do as like a fifteen-year-old or how old, however old he is. And he's he's making amazing work. Like the fact that he's doing what he does is super inspirational because he's at that age where it's unusual to have that kind of motivation to be like actually that dedicated to your personal projects is rare at that age. Most people are just like playing video games, doing whatever, messing around outside. Or maybe not messing around outside anymore. Don't really know how kids work these days, but 
the yeah it's rare for him to do that so you know that's like an inspirational like an inspirational speaker his story is interesting but i don't feel like i could really say anything that would be of interest like i'm in my 20s late 20s and i make stuff for fun like i'm basically a bum i just mess around and uh yeah i don't really have a real job I don't know. I don't feel like it's very inspirational what I'm doing. I'm just, uh, I just play with Blender and people give me cash for it. So, I mean, that's nice. I'm super flattered and honoured that I get to do this, of course. But yeah, I don't really feel like it's something that could be, I don't know. I find it hard to kind of cast it in a positive light, I guess. Um, so, yeah, planning a maths course for Blender. Yep. Um... Yeah, I know I said I was going to start that in January. It's not looking like it's going to be January. It's, I don't know why I thought it was going to be easy, but it turns out it's a lot more work than anticipated to build an entire curriculum. So uh, it is coming. And I should be able to start it from, I want to say sometime in February. I should be able to start putting out videos and they'll be out like one a week. And I think the way that I'm going to be uh, kind of building that process is that we'll be getting like a YouTube video each week. So the whole course in terms of the taught content will be free on YouTube. Uh, but if you want any of the like handouts and exercises and also videos like going through and reviewing the exercises. So I think essentially each week there's going to be a video, uh, plus an ex like a sheet of exercises and plus a review video where we go through the answers and like explain what's going on. Um, so the sheet of exercises and the review video, they will be specifically for people who have actually like purchased, purchased, I, I mean, you'll be able to like get it through Gumroad and then it will just get, the product will be updated each week with the extra things. And then, but yeah, if you just want the lessons, they'll all be free on YouTube anyway. Uh, so I hopefully will be starting to do that soon. Yeah. Oh, I've been playing, I've. I mean, there's a, there's a website called monday.com, which lets you, it's like a personal organizer kind of website. Uh, it lets you set up charts and spreadsheets and like manage your time and set things to auto, like automatically update and link to your calendar and things like that. So it's been really useful and I've been setting it up for the past week. Um, yeah, just to kind of help me manage my time a little bit. Um, oh. Hideo, thank you. And Carol. Oh. Well, I'm glad it's, uh, I'm glad the content is interesting. Um, all right, so let's do a little, let's do a little stack because we're going to be using these stacks. I should make a Discord channel so that people can help each other for that. Oh, for the maths. So I think, um, yeah, we'll, I'll just, I'll use the normal Arendelle XYZ server and we'll just set up like a channel or like a category of channels for people to talk about the math specifically um yeah i think that would probably be that'd be more than enough and it will get people integrated as well like even if they're outside of the 3d space it'll get them kind of to see that this is going on and that people are people are actually using these math things because i think that's one of the biggest barriers especially for young people in doing stuff like oh why am i ever going to use binomial expansion and it's like well if you do this specific job <laughs> then you may use it once or twice hello shall we hello happy new year all right so i want to use the accumulate node to make some rock stacks and let's work out how to actually make it make <laughs> make it make anything. So we're going to need a set position node. And we're going to need instance on points. And then we're going to need a cube or something just so that we can proof what's going on. And then I'm going to need a combine XYZ on my scale. That's RGB, but that's still fine. I don't really understand. Can anybody explain to me? why we have a separate combine RGB and combine XYZ, because there's no, these don't clamp or anything, right? 
I do this, um, it's just whatever. So this value, um, it's not actually being read at all. Do I need to capture it? Oh, right. maybe it's because the combine itself is clamped. Hey, acoustic hit and unknown user. Well, it should be fine because we can just like manually write in extra stuff. So all good. I'm going to set my everything to one to begin with. And we're going to be changing our Z, which is the blue. Do you know, what? I'm just going to change this so it's not confusing for people. There we go. Um, right. Random value into the Z. And then we need to position this based on, I think in the videos, Johnny does it based on the average between the leading and the trailing. So we're just going to add these two together and then uh, divide by two. So just multiply by 0.5. And then this is going to go into our Z position. Where is combined RGBA? Yeah, where is it? like a totally arbitrary uh, distinction between RGB and XYZ but you should actually have RGBA but then actually we're splitting alpha in the textures aren't we and the image textures there's a separate alpha channel so we don't even have like a vec4 right is this right it looks right I think that's actually worked awesome so why can't we just use the leading? Because it's... Um, oh right, because we're centering. Is that right? So if I was to use the leading, but I was to make sure that my cube was like centered on the bottom, is that going to work? 0.5. Maybe I mean the t trailing. Okay, so if it's centered on the base, you can start at zero. All right. Well, we'll use the average and we'll just center our things because we're not actually going to be using cubes. We're going to be making a few little things and uh, making them a bit more rocky. Um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's, um, in the compositor, somebody just said, oh yeah, isn't there RGB in, in the compositor? There is, we've got so many extra things in the compositor. I mean, look at this, combine YCBCRA. Who even knows what these mean? Cyan or yellow? I don't know, what are these CBCR ones? It just seems like a lot more stuff in the compositor, but it's also like not really been updated in a long time. Talking of the compositor, somebody was sharing on Discord the other day the um, the real-time compositor branch. So if you want to play with the actual branch with the real-time viewport compositing, you can you can just grab the branch and have a play with that. All right. Um, so the thing with rock stacks is they'll make something kind of nice shape, whatever. They should have a little bit of fall off at the bottom because everything which kind of, when you have erosion, right, stuff comes off here, tumbles down the side and lands in a bit of a pile at the base. So we need to have a bit of a skirt around each of our stacks. It's very easy, just proximity. And then we can basically make these stacks, which are going to be made out of individual pieces. Right, so I need to make a bunch of things which have a height of one meter, so this is all going to scale, do everything nicely. And then, oh wait, the YCBCR means color red, color blue. Oh, sorry, color blue, color red. 
That's weird. Why wouldn't they just assume that you know that it's red and blue? Um, <laughs> Michael, yeah, that's what we're doing. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be using the edge angle. Actually, do you know what? Does the edge angle give negative angles? Hang on, wait, let me just... Oh, let me save, actually, before we go too far into here. Tutorials, live streams. Oops. This one's going to be winter. Um, right, let's add a plane. New. We just want to read the edge angle. Mesh edge angle. I want to know if we can uh, calculate convex versus concave corners because that would be very useful. Um, actually, I'm just going to do it with the viewer. I have to set up my output attributes. There we go, so zeros. If I bring that down, we're getting a positive angle. If I bring that up, we're getting a positive angle. Damn. I want to know, you know, like this should be a negative angle, I think. And this should be a positive angle. And that's going to be, that slightly reduces what we can actually do with this node. Because, so what I was thinking is that if you were to have like a landform which kind of comes across like this, you want to, to, to make this like more rugged and jaggedy, right, procedurally, you need to know, um, basically you need to know the normal direction so you can say, okay, everything which is non-level, we're going to apply this texture to. But where you have convex corners like this top edge, we want to push this out in a positive direction. And where we have a concave angle like the bottom, we want to push it in. Um, so we could have used the edge angle to have calculated that if it was not just the magnitude. We might still be able to do some fun stuff. I mean, we definitely can. I've seen uh, Jesse on Twitter doing some nuts stuff with landscape generators and these like crazy high poly counts. But uh, yeah, I feel like having the edge angle would be very, very useful. Eric, why is Luma oh. and C, B, C, R a blue difference and red difference? Uh, DGC, how do I do the drag search? That is a 3.1 blender, 3.1 alpha. Let me just bring up my splash screen. Uh, yep, 3.1 alpha. I mean, today's build. Last hash is 741ED5F CD2E2. Ah, our first bot. Welcome. There we go. The uh, the Node Wrangler is not a Node Wrangler shortcut, by the way. The drag search that's just Blender now. As and the same for the timings as well. This is just in our overview, Node Editor overview, overlays up here. I might also turn on my minimap. That's always very useful. If you're interested in the minimap add-on, check the link in the description. That is linked down there for you. All right. Um, so first thing we're going to be doing, we need these rock stacks, and I think I need them to be individual objects. And we're just going to randomize how they're built, basically, how we based on how we locate them in the scene. Um, and then it's a shame we can't do like a random... This is something that I really want, and uh, it hasn't happened, would be a on the input object info node. I want a random socket. Right, just a, a socket which outputs a random value per the object that goes in here. And this would be really useful because it would mean that you could reference the current object by connecting this to the group input and that way, right, like that. And then we have the object and then we can set, oh, okay, so this object is referencing itself. Um, and that would be super useful because now if I were to duplicate this, you can see that the modifier on this one has updated its dependency to the duplicated version. Uh, and that's super useful because it would mean that you would have essentially a random value per object, which is consistent. Because the way that we actually have to do it is really gross, right? Um, 
you can see that's all twitching when I do that, changing that seed. And um, if I come in here with an integer, <clears throat> so just a random integer. Oh wait, no, I can't do that either. So I'm gonna, let's just add a white noise. It's probably the easiest way. Texture, white noise texture. Onto the location is a 3D thing here. And we need to make sure that the value which is by default between zero and one, is gonna be multiplied by some high value like 500. So now we have actual things, right? So now if I move this, you can see it's twitching, which is cool because it means I can get like a bunch of different ones and I can put them in different places and now they're all different. But I can't be like, oh, this one looks great. I'm gonna keep this one, but I'm gonna put it over there because now it's dependent on the location rather than the node tree value. And then the only alternative is to have like your seed. Um, that's a really rubbish group input. I really hate those granular nodes. I just I don't, they're not my thing. All right, so the only other way to do it is now to put the seed on the front and manually change it and be like, okay, well now it's consistent, but I have to manually change it. So that's also kind of annoying. But there we go, say the V. Let's make our rock stack generator to begin with. And then we can just basically make it make a bunch of rock stacks. We can't remesh inside geometry nodes. So we will be remeshing with the modifier, having another geometry nodes on there, which will do the erosion. Um, in fact, I might have a, I might make a geometry nodes tree. All right, let's bring up a text document in here just so that we can give ourselves a bit of a plan to do. I recommend you do this if you are, uh, if you're new to doing bigger projects, you know, it's different if you're like, oh, I'm just going to make this chair because, you know, there's a pretty clear line of, of what you need to do. If you're making a whole scene or if you're working on larger projects, have a, have a text document or even post-it notes, you know, do it by hand. When I was younger, I was used to have stick post-it notes along the bottom of my monitor. Uh, so I'd have like this row of post-it notes and I would do a test render and in the like 10 minutes, cause it always used to take like way longer to render stuff uh, or, you know, even longer while it was rendering, I'd be like, oh, that's wrong. Write it on a post-it note, stick it on my monitor. And then it would just, you know, it gives you this list, this to-do list. Graham, uh, mesh disappears if you, yeah. So what you need to do is add an instance realize instances node to the end and now you can export this this is now real geometry right so you need to realize those instances if you were to just apply this because these are instances there's some discussion around changing the apply um behavior to give you a choice between the current process or uh doing Oh, I can't remember what the three options were. So there was like having it as it is now where you just lose your instances. Oh yeah, making your instances real like we just did with the realize instances node or having it so that it will do, it will like make all of your instances real but separate objects, which is kind of like what happens if you do control A, make instances real. Uh, so now each one of these <laughs> has its own node tree. Um, but yeah, anyway, yeah, realize instances is the current, current process. All right. So first thing we're going to do rock stacks, uh, sock stacks, rock stacks, um, generator. And for this to work, we also need to make, uh, create rocks. Um, then once we've got that working, we need to create an erosion generator. In fact, maybe we'll do that after we've made the land because it needs to work on both the rock stacks and the land equally. Just for, you know, for ease. So I'm going to make the landscape. It's going to be a little bit of sculpting probably. 
uh, well, like sculpt plus procedural. So you can do like your general landform, sculpt it, or like block it and remesh, whichever you want to do. And then uh, it could also apply to socks, very true. Uh, and then you can do nodes, right? So we're going to, I'm just going to sculpt it for ease or proportional editing, whichever. And then we're going to do nodes just to like give us some more variation. It'd be quite cool if we can get some overhangs. So I want my erosion. How do you spell erosion? Is it one R or two R's? No, definitely one. Uh, our erosion node tree is going to create overhangs and things like that. And then we want to populate the scene. Um, which is going to be the rock stacks first, right? So we're going to add in our rock stacks which will also add in the kind of localized scree, like the, the rock which has fallen off. And then we can do... Oh, actually, do you know what? Before we do any of this, just because um, Jin just, did, just said about the book stacks, let's say how to make a bookcase, like how to make a row of books of different sizes, right? Because it's actually super easy with this node. It's basically just this, but in the X axis instead. But, um, or, or is it? Because we would need to know how wide each book was. We could definitely do it by scaling, but could we do it analytically? Like add in book number four and it's got a width of whatever. Actually, maybe I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I feel like I don't know enough about this node yet. Um, because you, you want to be able to, if you have a bunch of different books, right? Um, you want to make the books all the correct size for the book. You don't want it to be, that's terrible. Uh, you don't want it to be all of them at like one meter or whatever. So you want them all to be like, like however big they are. And then you want it to add the next one and then you want it to measure how big it is and find the position to add the next one and then the next one and so on. But is that possible here? Unless you have like a random integer coming through and assigned some way to compute that. Hmm. Maybe we could like, no, I don't know. I'll work out a way of doing it at some point and maybe we can like make a proper tutorial on it. In fact, that's probably quite a good one for a tutorial. Book case, there we go. Oh, so good having that Monday account because it means that I can just like have an idea and write it down and keep it forever. And actually have it in a place where I'm working, which is nice. <laughs> boring login name. Hey, welcome back. Love that thumbnail. Nice. Thank you. It was it was a lot of fun to make. I always enjoy making thumbnails now. Now I've just kind of accepted that it's kind of dumb. It's just so hard to come up with serious thumbnails and it totally takes the fun out of making videos. Not like making videos, but like pushing content because it's just stressful. It's like, oh, going to make something which actually sells this video. But now I know I just make dumb thumbnails which don't really sell the video. So I've kind of accepted that, but I enjoy making the thumbnails. That's good. Okay, so we're rock stacks, add localized scree. Then we want to add trees and logs and things. Then we want to add some ground foliage. Actually, before the ground foliage, if we have overhangs in our erosion we can also add like roots so if you have like a tree on top we can add it so that there's roots coming out of the cliff underneath i think that might be pretty cool um so maybe like ro uh, roots in overhangs and then ground foliage there's going to be snow so i don't know how useful ground foliage is actually going to be maybe we'll just do snow add some like rocks Add some, add snow. Snow is super easy. 
to make with geometry nodes. And there's a shader, because there's like an add-on for Blender. If you just search snow, you'll get the real snow add-on, and it's just really good. It's really, really easy. Uh, it like adds snow to whatever you want. So if I add Suzanne in here, and then I just like search for snow, just create snow, boom, <laughs> instant snow. And it's got a really nice shader on it. So I'm really going to be using it. So now I have the shader in my scene, right? So I'm not actually going to be using um, the actual snow add-on. Let's maybe go to rendered view here. Look how good that snow looks. It's so nice. Anyway, so we're just going to use this material because it makes our life easier. It would be nice if we can get an actual render out at the end of this. Uh, but I'm also not too stressed about that. We'll just we'll just see how it goes, have fun with making stuff. All right, I'm going to cancel that bookcase for now. All right, rock stack generator is pretty close to actually being done now. We just need to randomize the X and Y scaling. I wonder actually if instead of doing this, let's oops. Let's just do this like this. So we have two combined XYZs coming off our originally uh, our original random value, right? And this is setting all of our accumulate spacing and everything, right? All of this is defined by this random value. I suppose I should probably talk about the group index. Um, the group index is if you have a bunch of points, let's go index, and then we're gonna modulate this by um, something like, how many do we have here? 10, let's go by five or four or something. So now we have uh, two stacks I also plug this into the X. So there we go. Now we have, oh, now we have four stacks, okay. Oh, right, yeah, because it's going like one, two, three, four, one, two, oh, zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three. Uh, so if I just change this up to, to two, now we have two different stacks, and you can see that these are still going to be separate. Essentially, the group index, whatever number goes in here, every uh, every point which shares that index, that value, will be considered uh, to be in that group. That's <laughs> that's all there is to it. I'm just going to be doing single stacks and we'll be duplicating these and moving them around. So each one of these generators will generate one stack. So I think that'll do us. I think that'll be fine. All right. So now what I'm doing is I'm making a random vector with these two inputs. And there we go. And um, should I actually use the ETK node? This kind of saves us one. Ah, we'll be fine with this. Uh, so now, rather than going from like zero, zero, or sorry, one, one in the div, let's bring this in a bit, bring these up a little bit. Nice. Now, from my very, very cursory look at, at rock stacks, Generally, there is a bias for them to be bigger at the bottom, which would make sense. But actually, that's not always the case, because like C stacks, but we're not making C stacks. I was going to say C stacks get eroded more at the bottom, but rock stacks inland maybe also do. Okay, maybe it's totally random. Some of these actually are way bigger at the top. I guess because like the blow sound, the blow sand erodes them more at the bottom. Anybody who lives in sandy places, let me know. Uh, yeah, so the, here's the general idea, right? Rock stack, and then uh, we want to remesh. Currently remesh is doing nothing because we have not realized these instances. So then we can realize these. I know this is looking weird and blocky, but that's fine. Uh, we can then add a new, let me just make sure I'm renaming these rock stack for the first one. 
and then we're going to add a new one in here called erosion and we're going to use this one twice right so this is going to basically do like a noise displace and a foreign noise displace let's use a I'm just using a displace texture because it means I can plug in textures which are going to be Voronoi distance we're going to be interested in the distance to the edge and then in here I'm going to use a mix RGB erosion is based on the hardness of each layer of stone I mean that makes sense <laughs> but does that mean it's totally random uh, let's set this to linear light Let's go in the position here and we'll grab some noise in the base. There we go. See erodes faster at the bottom. Yeah, well, the. Hang on, let me pull this out. So, C does seem to erode faster at the bottom, but all of these ones seem to have been eroded more at the bottom as well, and these are inland. And these are like crazy landforms it seems like the the sand kind of comes in and whips out these little these little holes and we should actually be able to make holes like that it's these kind of horizontal striations that i'm most interested in and that is what the the rock stack generator is going to allow us to create because um where did that go because uh yeah these these things mean that we can have all of these different plates okay essentially they're slightly different sizes have a little bit of offset we can randomize that rotation a bit put this back over with my references uh picking certain rocks for certain areas but either ah uh, yeah texture based yeah well we're definitely going to do rock positioning based on proximity uh so you'll get more rocks around uh, you'll get more rocks on level surfaces for a start although we will have some sticking out from underneath stuff I'm probably going to just use some of the botanic ones because botanic is just like has these really excellent scanned rocks so I'll probably just throw in some of these as like underneath cliffs and things um they may have been partially eroded in prehistory when there was an ocean in the desert. That's an interesting idea, actually. Uh, oh, wait. Let's jump back in here. I'm going to make my voxel size way smaller. That didn't seem to make a lot of difference. And then, okay, something like this. And then we're going to reduce our scale here. Let's make this even smaller. Okay, so what I'm interested in is getting this kind of pattern, although it will go the opposite direction. There we go. Um, something like that. Let's make our mid-level lower. That kind of looks rocky. Something like that. Uh, let's also just scale this in the Z just a little bit. Something like... Uh, something like that it's probably adequate and then we can start messing up these edges a little bit so i'm just linear lighting in some let's smooth this as well so it should smooth i'm just linear lighting in a little bit of noise there so you can see straight lines wobbly lines it all just looks a little bit nicer potentially although obviously it still blocks so we need to sort out our blocks I think we probably need a bit of more general shape control as well. So this actually is not our erosion. This is our like rockify. So let's just do that like that. And we can also use this to set material when we come to it. I know I'm kind of doing things in a weird order. But sometimes you can just like build up your tools straight off at the beginning. All right, so the material, I'm going to use the materialic add-on. Well worth 
the, I think, like 50 bucks or whatever it was. Not everybody wants to just make um, materials. Oh, it's only 29 bucks. Is this on sale at the moment? No, it actually just seems to be like 29 bucks. Weird formatting. There we go. Awesome. Look at this. Oh, did I get the 4K one? Anyway, it's just a whole bunch of pre-made materials. I'm going to share this in the chat as well. Hey, we as well back. So yeah, I will be using Materialic and Botanic today. I really love their add-ons. I think they're a really great company. Uh, yeah, Polygonic. Polygonique. Um, anyway. Yeah, I just... I don't want to be spending a lot of time putting together PBR textures when you can just summon a PBR texture. So let's go ahead and uh, just make our lives a bit easier. Rock slate is probably fine. Nice example if you Google big eroded butte stock footage. Nice. So, a lot of striations coming through. Oh yeah, there's loads of stuff here. Where in the world is this? It looks like Mars. Incredible. Um, but yeah, we have all of these like, they're not even actually scree slopes. There's definitely scree on them, but these look a lot more solid. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna displace the land <clears throat> which is around our instance rock stacks. Just pull it up, basically. Uh, getting these erosion lines is going to be a bit harder. But actually not impossible, because we have the positions of our things. Um, so we can, essentially, if you position a radial gradient, so, okay, if you, here's my plane, and I'm going to position a rock stack in the middle. If I have this, so in like perspective, whatever, it's going to look something like this, and then you're going to have a rock stack in the middle, and then you're going to bring the land up, something like this, around it, right? So now we want to get these lines which kind of come in around. Pancake, Arizona or Utah, really? Damn, I really got to come to the States and just see it like just as like a tourist go and see the the landforms i guess it's a huge country but yeah we have nothing like that in the uk obviously i mean we have some beaches but that's like it <laughs> most of our beaches are just rock as well um so we have the positions of our rock stacks we can subtract that position from the world position to get a coordinate space on each one and then we can put on a radial gradient, which will look something like this, right? With a gradient coming around it. And then ping pong, or like multiply and then ping pong, that's gonna give us a bunch of sectors. We can maybe do that with some noise. And then you can use like a, a float curve or whatever to make it a little bit more bumpy. And then you can get this sort of, hopefully anyway, get this sort of erosion pattern going on. Hey, Charon, how's it going? Right, so I think, did we just, yeah. All right, so now I can just summon that slock, <laughs> that rock slate material. And hopefully. Oh, Eevee, I hate Eevee, it's so slow. There we go. I think these generally look better with cycles. Cool. All right, obviously not very good because it's made out of cubes, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna make these out of sculpted lumps instead. Hey, tiny Nick, how's it going? 
Yeah, it's been so long since I've been on a live stream. Is this three weeks? Also, <laughs> Pancake Master, last time I was on a stream, I said my eye was twitching, and you said I had my eye twitch for three weeks once. And yesterday was the first day in three weeks that my eye has not twitched. Like, it literally took three weeks. I'm not saying that you jinxed it, but... You jinxed it. <laughs> it was so annoying. Oh, wait. So this is our, like, Rockify. Makes it look kind of rocky. We need one which does, like, a general shape change, though, as well. Um, and we need to smooth out some of our other modifiers. We probably also want to have this set a little bit lower. Point. More salt in my diet? Wait, you mean I should have more salt? I thought you wanted, like, super low salt diet. To be fair, I probably, <laughs> I probably get, like, I don't know, half a teaspoon of salt a day? Maybe even less? I have such a low salt diet. So, to be fair, I have such a low everything diet. I have, like, a bowl of muesli once a day, and then I will, ha I will have dinner, like, a, a potato. <laughs> like something like that maybe some broccoli yeah i'm probably super malnourished actually i just hate i hate eating seems like such a waste of time uh, all right maybe you should start streaming on twitch just to make up for it <laughs> Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. That's right. Delicious taters. Okay. Rock stacks. So this is kind of already going pretty good. I need... Um, I don't know why I deleted all of that randomization thing before. We can bring in a collection here. We can sort out a rotation as well. Let's do a... Can we search for custom node groups? No, we can't. That's annoying. Why can't it just index every node you have available? Let's go for a random bias vector because we want it to be mostly nothing, but some of them can twist. That actually looks pretty great already. Um, I wonder if they... No, maybe we should just go for like mostly level, mostly level. So we're going like almost all the way back to zero. Um, but then like some can be rotated. And then maybe just because we want to actually have some actual rotation in both directions, we're going to use our bias with a um, with a, a just a normal random node. <coughs> Excuse me. So random vector in this case, which goes into our max. And we're going to go for a vector target of zero because we want it to be centered. And we're just going to increase this just a little bit. So that should be going positive and negative. Oh, yeah, it is. It was just, it was just a bad seed. All right, this is starting to look a little bit less terrible. So this bias Right, it's basically a power curve. The lower we have it, the more like this our power curve looks. So at zero, it's basically this. Basically, everything is the minimum. As we increase this, that power curve increases the amount that get affected, with some having a lot of effect. So you can see, we still have like the majority are pretty straight, but some of them are pretty like this one. Super, super bent over. Something like that is probably fine. All right. 0.05. All righty then. Maybe we have a little bit more Z rotation. Is that what we want? Maybe. Let's just go slightly more. In fact, let's go up to Tau. Just that we get a bit of bit of actual rotation. Um, uh, do you think that Blender is worth 
fluid sim. Oh, it's like it's usable for fluid sim. Yeah, just use Houdini. Anytime anybody asks me for like how to set up this sim, just use Houdini. You're going to make your life so much easier. And also, you're going to have so much more earning potential <laughs> if you know Houdini. It's like Blender is good, don't get me wrong, but it's like a generalist tool still. We just don't have that kind of level of specialism that you get with Houdini. Um, all right, I think I would like to maybe reduce my, wait, what's this random bird to do? Oh, right, so this is our gotcha. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract a little bit. Let me turn off auto offset as well. I'm already at the point where I don't want things to auto offset. Crazy. Um, and we're just going to subtract just a little bit, like 0 0.1 or something, just to give us those actual defined gaps. The remesh should still stick everything together, right? Not worried about that, but it's just to make sure that we have a little bit of variation where we're getting some more of that kind of striation in line here. Uh, Cassiano, how am I drawing? If you press D, press and hold D and left click. And if you want to erase it, D and right click. This is a blender shortcut. We have an annotations tool, uh, which you can just turn on. And if you want to find your annotations, they are under your view tab on the end menu. You can have multiple layers with different colors. So if you want to do this and if you are on, if you are animating and you want them to be like around forever, just click on the frame locked thing, make it locked. And now I can change frame and keep drawing and they won't vanish. It's very annoying otherwise. And yeah, you can change the opacity and the thickness. So it's all just like blender, it's blender stuff. All right. We need some inputs. I think I need to know how tall this is going to be. Oh, that got, that got a lot heavier. Um, I guess I want the. I want the. So okay. I want these to come out a little bit, right? Something, I don't know. It'll be randomized. So, but I want generally like a wider base. Um. So, and I want this to be defined by the height. Um, and I guess it should be some multiple of our predefined X and Y. You can tell I haven't planned this. <laughs> this, is, this is like how you build tools. It's just like, let me try something and uh, we'll see what functionality we have to add it. So let's grab our group input. Let me just go ahead and get rid of everything on here. I don't need any of these. I am going to turn this back down to like, actually it's the remesh that's taking the time. So let's just turn that off. And we can turn that off as well. Cool. Um, so the height in slices. Let's just go for 10 by default. I'm going to rename this to slices. There will always be a shortcut that you have missed. Yeah, I, re I remember Daniel Craft making a video like, because he did all of the like every modifier in Blender. And then he was going to do one on every shortcut in Blender. And I don't know if you know how many shortcuts there are in Blender. Uh, let's come down here. There's a few. Like, I mean, Jesus, look at this. So this is the grease pencil one. So then we've also got all of the ones which are inside all of these. All of the ones inside the clip. All of these, uh, they're just like the default ones. There we go. That's theirs. I don't know if anybody's done a total count. But there's like, there's a lot. And the more add-ons you have as well, 
the more shortcuts they will add to your your number of shortcuts. So when people say like, oh, Blender has too many shortcuts. Blender has a lot of shortcuts. You can basically do everything with the keyboard. I mean, look at this, this is insane. Let me just scroll down here. Oh, I haven't even expanded them all. There's probably a shortcut to expand all as well, do you reckon? You know, like Shift A, Alt A, Control A. Hmm, if there is, I'm missing it. Let's go ahead and expand all of these ones as well. There's just so many. Nobody, literally, I think it would actually be impossible to know them all. There's so many in here. It's crazy. And loads of these are like tweak as well. So it's like, uh, like pull for the pie menus and stuff. I mean, it's crazy. There's like thousands, literally thousands. I think Daniel Craft said there was over two and a half thousand shortcuts, which is why he didn't make the video. Um, crazy. If you want to know how many shortcuts there are, I cannot move the preferences window smoothly with all of the shortcuts expanded. That's unbelievable. All right, so we have our, let's just rename this one slices. And so the, the actual location and offset doesn't actually matter because we're setting position manually. So I can just minimize that. Uh, or even just control H to hide everything except from what I don't, except from the count. Um, we need a collection of things. And we want to randomize the instance index. So um, let's see where we get to in a while. I want to make sure that I'm getting these, right, let me just set that back up to like 30. I bet it's 11, no more, no less. That's, if only, if there were 11 shortcuts, we would all be such like blender aficionados. Okay, uh, I want to set the seed, but I want to set it by the location, which I know is going to be really jumpy when we move stuff, but I'm just going to have to accept that. Um, we're going to be manually positioning our rock stacks, I think. Because, yeah, we are. Or are we? I just think it's sometimes it's more useful to make manual tools like this and then manually position them. You could make it so that you would have a thing which generates a bunch of points, generates um, a bunch of these accumulate fields, does all of this for your indexing. You can do your group index for the number of stacks that you have, for the number of generated points, which you can find from your attribute statistic, finding the maximum value of the index of your points plus one. And then you would need to set the each stack to be like plus the initial start position of your, uh, yeah, you just add, add this to the position of your point. Um, yeah. All right, but so what we're just gonna do instead is just do this manually because it means that we can actually control our composition. And actually having composition control is like super important. As an artist, you wanna generate stuff which is, you know, kind of artistically viable. Um, do I wanna set min and max sizes for the slice? The answer is of course, yes. I want them to be in meters, which means I need something which has meters. There we go, thank you, grid. So this is gonna be our min slice, and this is gonna be our max slice. And the min wants to be zero. All right, just make sure we're saving. And we should go down to point one to one for our min and max sizes there. Um, these are fields. 
Does that mean that we could plug in like additional randomness? It does, which also means that you could like, if you were doing this as like a general, um, as like a general generator, which creates lots of different stacks, uh, then you could do it such that you could like weight paint your minimum and maximum things up based on your, your ground. And then you would just transfer that to your, uh, from the ground into these attributes. Uh, what are these? Oh, so these are our X and Y scaling. This is what we want to control based on the height and the minimum size. Uh, I'm actually going to do this based on radius uh, rather than X and Y because it's just a bit easier. So we're going to go radius. And then also we want like the radius like min and max. All right, but the max is going to be, okay, let's just start with this, right? Radius min, radius max. Um, so now if I was to just plug these in like so, then we're going to get these plugged in and working correctly. All right, max radius can be two, min radius can be one, they can get. Now I want to control it based on the Z height. Um, and actually instead of the Z height, should we use the, the, um, A person who has a ridiculously long channel name. I always see you in the Blender uh, Blender Today streams, and I'm always like, oh. it's like such a memorable uh, that one and boring boring login name, and they're like so ironically memorable. Oh, my eyes twitching again. God damn it. Maybe it's these lights. I need to uh, like wear a sun hat or something, or a baseball cap, as you call it over there. All right. So rather than doing it by Z position, because we're going to be moving these, I'm going to do it based on index, which we should be able to just get from these. I wonder if, do you know what would be useful is if the index had a factor output, kind of like the curve uh, spline parameter. Because in here you've got index, right, for all of your points, but then you also have factor, which is just zero to one along the length. If the index also had a factor, that'd be super useful. The group in the index in the accumulate node is OP. It is, although we're not using it today. We're making single stacks for, uh, for our sanity. And also because I'm not very good with the node yet. Uh, so index divided by the total count, subtract one. Um, let me just grab in a viewer node just so I can have a look at what I'm, what, what am I doing? Uh, if I plug in the index, we should get an integer list, which we do. Excellent. If I plug in the divide, we should get a zero to one good with one being on the outside. So that's why I did that subtract there. If I mute this, it's slightly below because the final index is 29, but the count is 30. So we need to make sure that those are the same so that we get a zero to one range. Uh, out to just tried Houdini for the first time and uninstalled Houdini for the first time. It's, um, yeah, I'm glad you're saying the first time because it's definitely not going to be the last. I have uninstalled Houdini twice so far, but it still runs the, um, I notice in the, if I start my task manager, I bet we can find a Houdini thing pretty quick. Just like running in the background. There we go. Houdini server running in the background. I don't have Houdini installed. Yeah, there it is. Seriously, it's like malware. This is why we like 
false mindset because it means you don't get all of this like it's fine because I kind of trust side effects although maybe I shouldn't but yeah just what are they doing basically a virus on my computer uh, maybe use a curve line instead of a mesh line so you have a factor I mean either way I would have to for the factor I would have to do a transfer attribute but because you can't transfer from a, a spline you would need or would you need? Yeah, you know what, maybe you're right actually. Maybe that would be quicker. Let me not delete these nodes because also in this is why you install it in a VM. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's a FOSS? Free open source software. And free doesn't necessarily mean financially free as well. It's like free as in Libra. But then there's also a differentiated one which is Floss, free and Libra open source software. So there we go. You see Windows 11, how's your experience so far? Windows 11 is like a really third rate skin. It's a, it's a nice theme for Windows 10. Unfortunately, it makes a lot of things horrible, right? So if I go in here and I click on something and I right click, I have all of these things and like, what if I wanted, what if this was a .7 zip file, right? I would have to come down to show more options to get the original Windows 10 one. And now I could go in like 7-zip and do it with that. Or I could do all of the things like scanning with Bitdefender or sending to my phone or whatever. So you always end up doing like the click and then show more options. You can do a registry tweak to just make it show this one. Uh, very annoying. Um, and then, yeah, the other thing is if you have your mouse at the top and you right click, cut, copy, rename and delete, that's what these are, although you wouldn't know it unless you hover over it. Um, they're at the top of this menu. And if you do it at the bottom, then I'm gonna have to go into one of these. Let's find something with a lot of folders. If I do it at the bottom, now these are at the bottom. And I know they're trying to be like, oh, it's next to your mouse. But it means that it's just very annoying. Like, oh, okay, they're at the top here. And then where are they now? They're not even on that one. There we go, now they're at the bottom. And it's like, oh, come on. Just, uh, my eyes are gonna go to the same place every time. It doesn't matter if it's right next to my mouse. I can move my mouse. Anyway, Windows 11, eh? Another bit of software, which is basically a virus. The fact that it tried to install it. Well, so I clicked Windows, do an update. And I didn't realize that it was, um, that it was Windows 11 that it was doing the update on. And this was like right in the middle of a bit of freelance work that I was doing as well. So I was like, I gotta make this stop. I gotta not have it do this update while I'm in the middle of this project. So I need to cancel the update. Um, you can't. And if you have finished updating, then you can't revert to Windows 10 without doing a full system re like rebuild so crazy oh yeah and no drag and drop on the taskbar so if you have files like this let me just find a blender file uh, vestige here so I've got a blend file right you can't just drop it on here anymore or even like an image I can't just open that it's crazy like dragging PDFs onto my file my uh, my browsers yeah, the context menu is a disaster. Also, if you wanted to, I don't know, like right click on the taskbar, this is the only option you get. What the hell? It's useless, it's so useless. Right click, I used to go like right click task manager all the time, but now I have to do control shift escape to task manager. And that's a really awkward shortcut as well to do with one hand, so I don't know, I like the rounded corners and I like the theme, but it is just, it's a theme that functionally makes Windows worse. So, yeah. If you're thinking about upgrading, get Linux or Mac. At this point, I would even say that Mac, maybe not for Blender, but like at least OS X is a better experience now than Windows 11, because Windows is doing this whole like convergent Thing between like tablets and PCs. 
very annoying. Cool, 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 cool. Noah, hey, hey, how's it going? Let's get back to Blender. So I'm going to be adding some value to my X and Y, min and max radius. Based up, because it's all working over here, I'm just going to do it with the nodes we have because we're already on the left. There we go. More bloat to keep to slow your computer down. Yeah. Yeah. Did anybody watch the Windows 11 keynote as well? You know when they were doing it back in I think August or something. The guy they had was basically in tears. He was so, you know, just this blessing of Windows 11. It was so disturbingly like corporate brainwashing. It was really unsettling actually to watch a grown man almost cry about how beautiful and wonderful Windows 11 is. And you get all these, you get the Teams integration directly in, so you can never get away from your boss. I just, uh, frankly, it's appalling. Linux, unless you're using an AMD GPU, very true. Yeah. All right, so I have this zero to one range. Um, I could put it through a flip curve and I'm gonna. Uh, the alternative would be to put it through a math node set to power. If you're just gonna use your flip curve like, like this or like this, just use a power node or yeah, math node set to power. Um, and then I'm doing it this way because we might wanna have like, so first of all, I'm gonna invert it. I want it to be zero at the top that we add and I may be doing something, whatever, like this, right? Then I'm going to use a math node, set to multiply, and then I'm going to add to both my x and y. Wait, can I do it after? No. No, wait, we have to do it on both of these. So I'll just set these to add. Do that like that, and like that. Hide, scale, All right, has this done anything that we want? Okay, there we go, nice. So you can see now we're getting bigger at the bottom. Uh, maybe something like this, right? Cool, so now we have a bit of control over adding some weight. You don't update Linux, Linux updates you. <laughs> It was such a joy. Like I've been on Windows for a few years now. I grew up, I grew up on Windows XP, Windows 95, whatever. And then I had uh, a laptop that was running Windows XP. It was a Mac. It was um. It wasn't a MacBook. It was a. It was an Acer Aspire One. I feel like I've spoken about this before, but it's always fun. Um, so an Acer Aspire one netbook right this thing was appalling in terms of its specs it was in uh, like a 10 inch oh we're we gonna get the specs on this one as well can't believe you can still buy these that's for 150 pounds oh actually this is a different model this is much more recent i can't believe they're actually trying to sell them Anyway, these, this is what I had. Um, so we've got like a 10, no, it, I don't think it was even a 10 inch screen, but it was like around there and obviously not a full keyboard, which is why I always use my number keys because I'm so used to having emulate number pad because I learned Blender on, on this. It was, an, it was an Intel Atom, one point something gigahertz chip with one gig of RAM and I think uh, like 50 gig of hard drive. Um, and that was really awful and it was really slow with Windows. And then one of my friends who's gone on to do other things, he's, uh, he basically was like, oh, try Ubuntu. And I basically started using Ubuntu then. So I guess from like the age of maybe 12 to, when did I go back to Windows? 
I didn't have Windows 8, it, so it was Windows 10 that I got back onto. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I was I was using Linux for a really long time, and then I've been using Windows for a while because of like working and needing to use Autodesk, um, which I don't have to do anymore, which is why I removed it the other day. Um, but now I have uh, a laptop, and I booted it with Manjaro, and it was such a relief to get back on Manjaro. And I've actually got another laptop, which I have uh, Windows 10 on. It's like a, um, I don't know what you'd call it. It's, it's like, it's not a netbook, but it's like, you could you can, you couldn't use Blender on it, right? It's just for browsing and writing documents. I bought it basically to write my dissertation at uni. Um, but I, uh, <laughs> I turned it on the other day because I had to do some team share, team, team viewer with somebody. And uh, it was so good. Oh my God, Windows 10 is so nice. If you're still using Windows 10, it's oh, it's like crisp and it's fast and things are where you want them to be. And they just work as well. Like you right click and stuff happens. Endeavor OS, oh, I've heard of that one. Endeavor. Oh, Archbase Linux. The successor to Antigross. Oh, interesting. A terminal centric. Wait, so do you have a UI or are you just command line? Oh, it certainly looks like it has a UI. Actually, it certainly looks like Windows. But yeah, Arch based. If you're getting into Linux, I recommend I recommend um, one of the Arch based ones. I mean, I recommend Manjaro because it's super easy and super just like yeah, it's really easy to install. It's basically like the Ubuntu of Arch Linuxes. But the great thing about it is it's a rolling release and um, rolling releases don't, so generally with like Debian based ones, they update every six months and you get an LTS every two years, I think. Um, so yeah, every, you know, you get like, I, don't know, I think like 1204 was my last Ubuntu. But then you would get like 13.10 and you would do this whole like system update and a bunch of stuff would break and then you'd fix it and it, and I just kind of got tired of doing that. So with Manjaro, it's like every time I log in, there's a bit of, there's, there is stuff to update, right? It's kind of like running daily builds of Blender, but it's it never does like a really big seismic update where everything breaks. And I just really appreciate stuff not breaking. Yeah, Manjaro is Arch based. Um, yeah, oh my god, I would never go back to not rolling release for like for personal computing. I would, uh, yeah, as soon as I can find something which works like InDesign and basically like the Affinity products, uh, like I've got Publisher, Photo, Designer. Uh, so designer I can replace, and actually I choose to use Inkscape anyway. Um, photo, please don't make me use GIMP, it's terrible. It's just so bad. Um, Critter is good, but it's not really so much for editing. And then I've been using Darktable a little bit, which is also good. Um, and it's great because you can do all of your development stuff in it. But, you know, with photo, let me just open it and show you. Uh, blender, blender number. Is this your job or do you do something else on the side too? This is what I do. Yeah, this is what I do. I make courses actually. Well, yeah, so I make, I make content that educates people about Blender. Let me just, um, here we go. So I've got, um, a thing. Let me bring in a picture. Let's come in here. Let's just grab one of these vestige ones, right? So this is a thing. I made with uh, it's like it's an audio it's a vestige of some audio it's actually quite an interesting project I did it with animation nodes it basically prints audio uh, frequency and amplitude over time and creates a thing so this was like a whole speech I think this was actually the Brexit speech um, over the top of this thing which was supposed to be 3D printed anyway 
the point is, right, affinity photo. I have got an image here, right? And uh, I think it needs to be a pixel layer so we can actually work on it, but there we go. So I have all of the Photoshop stuff that I can like paint over it and do clone stamping and airbrushing and whatever. But I can also just go into develop mode, right? And now I have like this full uh, developer mode, which is like dark table. So the issue with the like the FOSS stuff is I can use dark table to do like the development on my renders. But then if I want to actually like combine layers and clone stuff out and do different stuff like that, which I often do with renders because I'm comping multiple layers together, like background, shadow, reflection, and everything. I'm going to want to do that through something which allows like photo editing, kind of like GIMP, but GIMP is horrible. Um, I just, I used GIMP for years, like literally years. I used it as like my main photo editor for close to a decade. And, uh, God, it was just, I, I never enjoyed using it. I never liked the interface or the shortcuts or, I don't know, it just felt like it was different for different sakes. Anyway, Blender number, do you do deductions on your computer equipment? Um, no, <laughs> because I'm not like, I'm not a registered educator, if that makes sense, like I'm a teacher and I teach online and that means that I can claim things back on tax um, but it's dependent on me paying enough is it it's dependent on me getting enough income to pay tax which is a pretty tall order actually like for me to get more than twenty thousand pounds it's just not likely right that's just that's not really there's I don't so as much as it's like oh yeah I can you know I can buy a camera and then when I'm doing my tax return, I can claim it off as an expense. But it doesn't matter because it's not like I'm paying any taxes anyway, because I don't earn enough to pay taxes. So, yeah. So not to say that I'm like, it's not that I'm evading tax by not paying taxes. It's like I do not earn enough money to to qualify for the government taxing me. They're like... I'm like a, a pity vote, basically, from the government. Um, which is fine. It's fine. One day it will get to a point where I can have my own place. <laughs> There's a... I, actually, I, I might talk about this. Um, I'll definitely talk about it more in the future. So I'm planning on building my own house. But like, So I used to be a cabinet maker, and... Um, the, one of the issues right, with earning so little and wanting to, you know, live in, in the countryside or, you know, cause I've grown up in the countryside. I don't, I don't massively love city living. Like, it's cool and all, but at the same time, your stress level is just, like, unnecessarily elevated. And especially with, you know, COVID and everything going on, it's just like, a, I don't know, it kind of makes you reevaluate what you're doing. So, um, uh, Darren, the float curve is a temp solution or final? So this is going to be the final solution for like randomizing my thickness over different points, um, to give me like a general sculptural shape. But if it's, um, yeah, so I'm going to be able, I can basically randomize the amount that this is impacted based on this. So we can do that. Um, but yeah, just a general sculptural shape of the actual stacks themselves, so that I have some kind of consistency in the shape language of the final render. Um, well, that's why we're using the float curve here. Uh, Benjamin Kern, are you able to live off 20k? I mean, you could live off 12, yeah. You, like, yeah, I could rent a flat uh, in Manchester, like in a city in Manchester, um, for 700 a month, right? So, for for I guess that comes to like 8,000 ish a year plus 2,000 on food and it maybe another 1,000 or 1,500 on additional expenditure I mean if you never go on holiday which I don't and you don't drive a car which I don't I can but I cycle um, and obviously if you're in a the city then you're only going out to cycle anyway 
right? Or like cycling is the best, the fastest form of transport in a city. So yeah, I think you can, you know, you can live on 10K, but you know, it doesn't take into a factor of me like, like it, what if I wanted to go on dates or what if I found myself having kids? It's kind of unlikely, but it's, you know, it's an expense which I just can't afford. Like I cannot afford to have that kind of lifestyle where you have like a full <laughs> life. <laughs> I'm a I'm a tool to make node tutorials. That sounds way sadder than it is, but like I'm fine with it. Anyway. Um I'm not I'm not like struggling for money. I live in my parents' house. I'm saving up to buy a plot of land to build an off grid eco, like self sustaining um yeah, like sustainable living. Like I'm really into that, like alternate alternate living. I always used to want to do van life. And just like, you know, like buy a Mercedes Sprinter and convert it into a kind of uh, portable residency. And then, uh, yeah, that didn't happen because of, you know, the global pandemic. And then, yeah, I just couldn't really face being in a van with all of that going on. So I didn't end up doing that and I ended up doing this, which is kind of cooler anyway. Um, also, and what's that life thing you talk about? Yeah, seriously. Uh, but yeah, so I want to, and I'm going to, obviously like I'm the sort of person who's just like, I will make everything into content because I'm 27, 27 as of about two weeks ago. So I'm just at the end of my twenties. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I reckon I can do a full build of a house. And also, you know, like turn it into content, turn it into lessons and YouTube and Patreon and things like that. Um, I reckon I can do that for 120,000, I reckon. Um, but Hideo, yeah, I know. Well, I know people who live in their vans. Uh, I mean, I don't think it sounds cool. <laughs> I think it sounds pretty difficult, but I think, um, like my alternative, right, is getting a house with, I can't, I don't really qualify for a mortgage because I don't have like a consistent income. So a bank is not going to lend me money. And if they do lend me money, it's not going to be at a, at the kind of, uh, interest rates, which I could afford because they would want that as like a guarantee. Basically they would make it, it's a higher risk investment for them. So they would make it uh, pay them back more. Um, and then, yeah, so I can't get a mortgage, right? So I have to save up anyway, uh, which means I'm, my limit is like, is going to be the same amount of money, right? So like 120, 150,000 after another five or 10 years or whatever of living in my parents' house. So then it's like, you know, and I don't, I don't mind. I'm like obviously really grateful that I can live at my parents' fat at my parents' place. Um, but yeah, for me, like moving out of country is not really a viable option. You know, like I couldn't just be like, oh, well, I'm just going to move to Argentina where it's cheaper or India where it's cheaper because that's, I don't know, I'm not really, I want to live in the UK. That's, I, it's, that's where I'm from. Um, but yeah, so if you buy a house, right, with like 150,000, then you're not going to really be in a nice place. Frankly, like you should buy the worst house in the nicest area that you can afford. And for that little money, you're like considerably below the start. The average price for a starter home is £206,000 in the UK. So anyway, I'm pretty good at building stuff and I'm pretty interested in eco living and sustainable development and architecture. And I just really want to build my own house with my hands like get a shovel and a saw and buy some land. And uh, yeah, anyway, so in like four, three, hopefully three years, I was gonna, my aim was to do it when I turned 30, um, which is which is in three years. And I know that's gonna happen very, very quickly. Um, Culturally, living with your parents is very different. In the US, there's a big thing about leaving and a bit of stigma moving back later in life. There definitely is here as well in the UK. 
Um, maybe not to the same extent, I think, because house prices have just gone a bit crazy. I don't think we have the same level of affordable living that people have in America. From what I've seen from, I've done some like house searches and things, and it seems like your, your houses are very cheap. <laughs> they seem so cheap. Uh, like obviously you still have really nice expensive houses as well, but it just seems like there's a lot of affordable, more affordable options relatively. Anyway, sorry, that turned into a bit of a tangent. Um, you ought to build your house procedurally. Maybe, well, uh, I mean, it has to get designed and go through planning. But there's certainly going to be a lot of things. Like, obviously, I'm generally kind of umming and ahhing and thinking about, like, what I can do. Um, evil do it. Those crazy prices. Average house price is a million in the Toronto area. I mean, that's in a city, though. I mean... Yeah, to be fair, actually, healthcare is insane in America. I mean, how much is an average house price in Manchester in Canadian dollars? Because I bet it's over a million. Uh, oh, actually, that's way less than I was expecting. So it's only two hundred and sixty thousand pounds for a house in Manchester. Two sixty in Canadian dollars. In CAD, yeah, that's only actually like half a million. But there's a lot of horrible places in Manchester, so maybe that's why. Um, you could get people who want to learn to build to help you build it. Ah, yeah, Augment. So, um, one of my friends, and actually my ex used to do this a lot as well, go on, they're called Woofing. I think it's actually three O's, isn't it? Woofing. Um, oh, sorry, it's double, double, uh, sorry, W-W-O-O-F. Woofing is like... So basically people go and do these like communal things and you can sign up to be a host or a woofer. What's that actually stand for? Uh, so yeah, so you could totally get in like volunteers to come and help you. What does it stand for? Um, worldwide opportunities on organic farms. And my thing would basically essentially be an organic farm. Cost of living is higher in the UK though. Yeah, I think it is actually. Um, uh, per country I mean to be fair if you're living in the valleys in where we have the biggest rich poor divide in the in Europe in the UK between like Kensington or something in London and the valleys in Wales who um, oh, yeah, has you're a woofer oh right because you're like basically a dog <laughs> Cost of living uh, comparison. I want to know, like, is, wait, is Toronto the capital of Canada? I don't even know. Um, I don't know if this does everywhere. Let's do uh, London versus Toronto. Yeah, USA healthcare scares you. I hate the idea that it's like, oh yeah, you have the freedom to, it's the freedom, you know, you have the freedom to not pay. It's like, yep. You have the freedom to be bankrupt because you broke your ankle. 13.8% lower. Oh, including rent, you're 22% lower in Toronto than London. 22%, that's insane. Uh, can we do... Manchester. Manchester should be quite a lot cheaper. Oh wow, so Toronto's more expensive than Manchester. That's interesting. 
I'm surprised there's such a difference between Manchester and London, but there we go. Yeah, yeah, you have to pay for ambulances in the States. You have to pay for everything. You know, like when people are, you, know, like you give birth and then it's like, oh, you want to touch your baby? Pay me. Like, how is that, how is that not like worthy of riots? Yeah, that's staggering that people aren't rioting about that. Oof, COVID hospitalizations. Several thousand for, oh my God. I can't believe you're not more like risk averse in America. Like what well, healthcare is so expensive, but then you would still give a 16 year old a gun. It's like mind boggling. Let's go to Canada. <laughs> All right, um, what am I doing? We've made our rock stack generator, kind of. Um, we need some more control in here. Let's set up our location thing. So mesh input object info. Let's grab our current object, which is just going to be cube. And then the real question is, are you united or city? Uh, Man city. You have to pay for ambulance rides in Sweden too, but it's 40 pounds. I, 40, oh sorry, 40 euros, so like 35 pounds. Pancake, your brother's birth was a million dollars. Are you, like, but did you have to pay that? I don't understand, like, how, who, how much, how much is, I don't understand. <laughs> like, what? Who pays that? That's like ridiculous. Right, let me move that to the top just because it's like. Uh, we're going to location into a white noise. Can give value into a multiply. Just going to increase this arbitrarily. Let's go up to like a thousand. Oh, sorry, your brother's child's birth. So that's what gets billed to the insurance company. So what if you don't have health insurance? I mean, you say he paid £2,000, but how much does he pay for health insurance? That's crazy. Yeah, I'm, uh, Riaz, if you do, I, I know a lot of people do like dental care. They'll go to like Thailand or like Indonesia. They'll like go for a holiday, get their dental work done in a foreign country and then fly back because that like that holiday plus the dental work in a, abroad is, is cheaper than just getting the dental work done in the States. Crazy. All right. Bit of randomization. It's made our seed work a little bit. So now we've got this kind of annoying, but it, you know, changes depending on where we put it, which is going to be a little bit difficult for our composition, I guess, maybe. I mean, we can always just like get more or less in the right place and then just kind of tweak it until it's the right size for what we want. Um, I'm poor enough to be on free version of Obamacare, which includes dental. It's actually really nice. You've just got to be poor enough. <laughs> it's like, it's such a, I don't know. I'm sure that someone is going to chastise me or like clip this out of context at some point, but it's surely, surely people just know that, surely people know it's corrupt right? Surely people don't support it. I just don't understand how people can look at other countries and the way that other countries are like working with their healthcare and being like, oh no, this is fine. This is fine. All right. Man, 
medication costs something like approximately 70,000 per dose, which is insane because I pay £9.25 a month for, for prescriptions. It's just such a different, such a different world. Hmm. All right, let me get back to my rocks. So we've got our stack working. I want to randomize the this. If I just do that. Yeah, that's not really what we want either. So let's map range this. Um, I'm kind of going in circles here now. Let's actually just do that. All right. And we'll come down the back here. All right. So this map range controls how much we're going for. From zero to one, it's going to go from one to five. Cool. So now we get some randomized amount of that um, kind of bottom heaviness. Uh, where are we going? Uh, Lucas, I'm scared to update to Blender to Blender 3.0. 3.0 is fine. Um, yeah, yeah, like Darren said, 3.0 is fine and stable. And all of the versioning means that you can actually still use the legacy attribute nodes with old old geometry nodes projects um, compared to. 3.1 <laughs> if you if you make something in 3.1 and then go back to 3.0 you will get red nodes because things like the accumulate field does not exist or the compare node has been updated and it will not work in 3.0 uh, but there we go John how's it going good morning to you um Rotation. I guess we want to maybe just have this on a slide. Oh, this is where we really want that mix node, like the official one. But it's fine, we'll do it this way. So we're going from zero to the this one. Do you know what else would be really cool um, in Blender? We have this deviation. I've set the value, right? And I'm going to go and create a combine XYZ, right? But now this combine XYZ is full of zeros and that's not very useful to me. Like I want this to adopt these values. Kind of like if I have in Spedrock and I've got something like a matrix, right? And if I set these values to be different and then I, I'm like, okay, let me just pull this off, create a new parameter. You can see that this has come in with the correct values, right? These have been moved across correctly. So Spedrock, Kind of has some UX things, which I think we should, which I think we should pick up in Blender. Um, yeah, phonics. So cumulative sum is what it's doing. Essentially, you can see that all of these. Let me just set this back to zero. All of these are a different thickness, but they're still kind of packed together. And if I change my seed value by just moving this slightly, because I've got it set up on the position, you can see that it's changing height. It's always the same number, but they're random heights per slice. So, yeah, super useful. Bloop bloop, you're still setting up Blender 3.0 because you prefer the 2.7 UI and controls. Interesting. I guess if you're really used to that. Um, depends if you're much of a tutorial follower, and I guess as well, like your level of uh, Blender skill, because if you are wanting to follow tutorials, Sometimes it can be very um, frustrating having uh, not having the same UI. All right, so this is going to let me set this randomness. Are we going to set this with the noise as well? Let me do a separate XYZ, 
separate RGP on my white noise, it's going to give me three different random values. Okay. I know it's like, it looks like it's glitching out. It's just, it's how we've designed it. Ideally, like I said before, we would have a random number socket, which I could just have like a random value per the current object. So that it would be like per node tree instance or something like that. I think that's why it didn't, uh, why, why they didn't want to add it was because it was like, there was a better way to do it, I guess. Um, questionable. I mean, I like having the random socket because then it's the same as the shader node and it's like kind of a known thing then, but there we go. Finally starting to understand geometry nodes and shader nodes, and it's the coolest thing just being able to make something. Yes, it is. Because you you sort of, this might sound a bit weird, but you're sort of sculpting, right? You're massaging the values, the data into the shape that you want. And I think that's just like a really cool feeling that it's, um, that you have a system and you're just, every step, you're just like pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until you end up with a shape that you want. It's just the same as modeling. But with modeling, it's destructive. So you can't really go back um, easily. At least you can't, you can't go back while maintaining some steps. With procedural workflows, you can maintain as much as you want. This random bias stuff. So this is our rotation. That's fine. All of our scaling is fine. Or well, the position is fine. Okay, so I'm happy with these controls. And now we just need to make some rocks, some rock shapes to fit in. <laughs> or so many nodes for a pile of randomly scaled default cubes. I know, but it's just, I mean, you don't, you don't need half of these. You could do it with just, um, if I do that, there you go. This is all you need. And if I do that, oh, delete unused does not take into account muted noodles. Um, I'm massaging the values here. Yeah. All right. This is all looking good. Let's make some rocks. I'm going to attempt to sculpt some vaguely. Let's get some references on the go. I'm not too worried about what they look like. A little plug as well for Sense Labs. If you don't know Sense Labs, they're like a Wacom alternative. Um, they've basically they've sent me a bunch of hardware, right? So I just want to talk about like their accessory packs because they're so freaking nice. I've had Wacom hardware for, for years um, and it is good, right? It works. It works. It does what it says on the tin. But with my Cintiq, which I spent a lot of money on, that's like the one which is the that is the display tablet, right, with the screen. Um, they sent the Cintiq. That was kind of it. Like there was no, there was no case or anything, so I can't really take it around with me. I know that's like a very niche thing to want to do, but you like a case would be separate. A stand would be separate. A separate eighty dollars, I think, for the stand. Uh, you get a pen and you get four nibs or maybe three nibs. Um, but that's it. Like there's no glove. There's no, there's no nothing. Everything else you want is, is separate. Uh, with Sense Labs. So they sent me, this is the small tablet and I specifically wanted a small one because I don't have a huge amount of real estate, uh, for putting, for putting stuff down. And I, and oh, I have another tablet, right? I have the Cintiq, so that's fine. Uh, so they sent me that and they sent, along with that, right, comes an accessory pack, right? And they, it comes in a freaking pencil case, which is like, I don't know if you can hear this. Oh, so good. It's like a proper like soft closing magnetic case. All of your things. It comes with two pens for a start. This is all just, oh, it's genuinely so nice. Like the way that they've wrapped it up and put it all together is just so nice. And obviously I want to 
compare. Oh, it's sense labs. So uh, it's X, X, E, N. Wait, can we see that? Can we be able to focus? There we go. So X, E, N, C, E, L, A, B, S, sense labs. Uh, they're a Canadian company, I believe, Vancouver. Um, so let me just compare as well. Like, okay, so this is the Wacom Pro Pen 2. Come on, we're gonna get focus. There we go. So this is the Wacom Pro Pen 2, and you may think this is also a Wacom. Come on, focus. Not on my face. There we go. Um, it looks identical, right? The shape is identical. They're not trying to hide it, but you get extra buttons. This has more buttons than the Pro Pen 2, and they're super useful. Because I was always like, oh, you know, you get your like your tip button and you get two buttons. Also, these. Pro Pen 2s wear out so fast. Like the buttons on them, they're just not very good anymore. Um, and actually this Sense Labs ones, it's been really good. So lots more, lots more clicky. Um, do I have a ref referral code? I don't actually. Um, they, we should, I should be getting one when I do a video. Um, and another thing, so, okay, so all right, I've got the two, so they've sent two pens for a start, which is always really nice, because I've got the one which looks like a Pro Pen 2, which I just use like a mouse. Um, but if I'm doing drawing, I use the other one. And this one actually feels a lot more like an Apple Pencil uh, in terms of thickness, and that's not going to display. Let's try and get this. It's got, you can see it's got a grey nib, right? It's a felt nib. It feels a lot more like, I don't know, it feels like graphite which is really nice. Um, so yeah, in terms of the quality, I would say it's actually like better quality than Wacom. Um, John, you have an XP pen and the tablet is, off, is awesome, but the software is not. Uh, I wonder, let me just bring up the, the I keep saying accents, but it's, come on, Sense Labs, okay. So let me turn on my tablet. And they also sent me a, this is a separate product, but it's really good. Um, so it's essentially like a it's Bluetooth. It's got almost no battery at the moment because I've been using it. Um, and see it's got a screen on there. Just wait for it to connect. There we go. So you can see now that this has, come on. Uh, we have like a scrolly wheel and we have a, uh, eight buttons and also you can change the settings so that you can have like up to 40 different macro keys here is that right eight oh no eight yeah eight times five so 40 different macro keys and you can set the different modes on here so this is actually really good but yeah um sense labs is like the so there's there's another company called uji who is like super budget but the company that owns uji right they're called uji as well they own sense labs xp pen and uji and they're like the three lines they're like the pro line is the sense labs and then like the kind of general commercial level is um is the xp pen and then the super budget is the uji ones how does the wheel feel uh so the buttons on here these buttons are metal the whole thing is quite heavy um, and it has these really nice like cutouts on the back so it's really nice to actually hold it so when i'm painting uh, i have this set up for critter with like a, a bunch of different critter shortcuts uh, so i can just be like pen and this and i can do everything with that um i've not quite worked out how to set it up for blender i think for sculpting or for texture painting that would be fine but for like for node workflow it, i don't really have enough buttons for enough shortcuts i'm still trying to work this out um but how does the wheel feel? So I do actually have, I don't know, the wheel itself is plastic, which I think is a shame. And if I if I just flick the wheel, if I get that into focus, you can see that it's, or maybe you can't, but it doesn't spin for a really long time. I guess like a normal spin, I can get it to do two full rotations. But I mean, I'm just generally like spinning it. If I go into Blender, you can see it on my side there. So it's nice and easy, like I can control it, forwards and backwards, whatever. So that's fine. Oh wait, you can't even see Blender. Let me let me do that. 
All right. So if I'm scrolling this, if I scroll this wheel, right, you can see that that's coming in and out nice and easy. It feels nice. It's smooth. If you want to know what a good jog wheel feels like, this is a um, DaVinci Resolve one, and this is a this is like a fully metal jog wheel, and this thing spins forever. It's so spinny. Feels really good that one as well. So if you, I mean, that's like a super niche thing, and you can only use that with DaVinci Resolve, which was a weird decision for them to make. Because that would have been that would, that that DaVinci Resolve keyboard would have been like the best macro keyboard, um, but it only works for DaVinci. Anyway, what was I talking about? Right, so uh, Sense Labs, yeah, they're really good. If you're interested in getting a a tablet, I recommend Sense Labs, uh, just because, and they send a glove as well. And sorry, I know I was going to stop talking, but they sent so they send carry cases for freaking everything. Look at the carry case for the tablet. Hey GM, no worries. We're only um, we're chipping it, chipping away. All right, so this is the the one for the tablet. Unfortunately, it's very slightly too small for my laptop itself. I'm just sorry that was really loud. Um, so Velcro closer. It has all of the things for your extra stuff, right? So you can put your put your pencils in here. Nice. They all fit in your pouches. But. Oh my god, this is, it's fleece lined. How completely unnecessary, but also, I don't know, I just, there's just something really pleasing about that, like, total over-engineering. It's literally nicer than my laptop case. There we go. All right, I'll stop, I'll stop promoting this stuff now, but I just think it's really, I think it's really good hardware. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, the XP, oh, Brad, you're wondering about using it for cheapest jog wheel for Premiere. Uh, do you know, I don't know actually how cheap these are, the quick keys. I actually have two because one of them had a knackered battery, which was unfortunate. It takes like, so if, if you're using it, it takes like three or four days to discharge of like pretty heavy use. Because the, the, you know, they're not really doing much of these quick key things. Um, but yeah, the first one they sent me, it was taking like four days to charge to 100%. So they sent me, a, they sent me another one. Um, let me have a look at how much the actual quick keys cost, because it literally might be, oh, it's only $90. I mean, that's a lot of money, but it's, compared to the DaVinci Resolve keyboard, which is like $250. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you just use Touch Portal. Oh yeah, Touch Portal is another really good one. So that's, uh, let me let me just go back to my screen so we can before I forget. So Touch Portal is a an app. I believe it's is it just on Android or is it on both? Touch Portal. Um, and I think you just I don't know if it's it's on Mac OS as well. Do the pens use batteries? No, they are um, they're the same as Wacom, basically. Think of it as a Wacom for half the price. That's the best way to think about it. half the price. In fact, maybe more than less, like less than half the price, better value than half the price because of all of the accessories that they send you. Um, anyway, yeah, touch portal. This is a really good one for using your macros. I have a stream deck as well. Um, I would seriously recommend if you're wondering about stream decks to not buy one because they are garbage. In fact, everything Elgato has done, I, own key lights right which is what is illuminating this space um and they were not cheap right and they're so badly made 
there's like the the screw threads are plastic if you spend a, that much money on a on a light like you're you're basically in professional photography m money right for when you're looking at um at like the elgato key lights just useless not only that but they're supposed to be um they're supposed to be wi-fi connected i use my phone i'm pointing at my phone the for, for 4g right because my broadband in this location is very bad unfortunately because i walk around the house with my phone as well the light disconnect from the wi-fi which means that they basically don't work with the wi-fi uh, which means that i have to turn them on and off on the back of them which also means that i don't have any um the, i would just don't get elgato stuff they're not very good they're really not very good the stream deck is plastic as hell the keycaps rock left to right they feel very very cheap for something which costs over a hundred pounds no i really don't rate it really don't rate it um um, right, you have a stream deck and you love it. I mean, I'm sure if you use it, like for what, it, but I think the 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 build quality is so bad for the amount of money that you spend on it. Like, if you were to get a custom keyboard, right? You can get a keyboard and you can get like proper keycaps, and you can set it up with a custom, like, a custom little keyboard thing. Um, and set that up with macros as a custom thing and then you're going to have all of the feel of a keyboard with proper keycaps and like straight action that doesn't rock ah anyway sorry i guess that um that means i will never get an elgato sponsorship but i think that's also fine because frankly i don't want any more of their products right let's go in here stream deck is expensive but you've used it for tons of stuff Oh, the XL. Is that the one with like 30, 30 buttons? There was another one that kept getting recommended to me on Amazon. Good old feeding Jeff Bezos. Um, if I search Stream Deck, it should come up, I think. Um, yeah, the Lupe deck, which is like not even that much more expensive. Especially, all right, so the Elgato Stream Deck Mark II is like £140. It's, it's, I would pay maybe 60 and that's why I would rate it at. Um, let's, this is the Lupe Deck and it has like physical buttons around the outside, but then you also have these ones in the middle, right? And they're the same as the screens. It's more expensive for sure. But it also seems to do a lot more and i bet it's also like physically better made i mean you really couldn't be much worse made than the stream deck i wish you could see how much the buttons rock it's like they're on top of a pin oh. pancake if anybody wants custom keyboard advice talk to him do you know what actually in maybe 12 months or something i will probably be building um like a proper macro keyboard setup. So I will definitely talk to you then. Find yourself using, you have a Cintiq and a regular Wacom and you find yourself using the regular one more than the screen. And I think Brian mentioned before actually about the XP pen, just using the screen itself as a tablet and not having it used as a screen. One thing, um, one thing that I found with the Cintiq is it's, unless you're spending a day drawing, right, a whole day, then you don't really get the benefit of having a screen. It's just like, oh, you know, I've got all my applications up. Now I have to move them to where I'm going to do a little bit of retouching this while I'm like hunched over my desk. And then I'm going to like sit back in my chair, pull this up. It's just better, in my opinion, to, to have this. Like I found that I, with my Cintiq as well, I just unplugged the HDMI cable because I was just like, I'm just using this as a tablet now. Anyway, I was gonna sculpt some rocks, so I should probably do that. Let's 
come in. Oh, actually, I was going to show you as well the the UI as well. So, because somebody was mentioning about the XP Pen software not being so so hot, um, the Sense Labs one's really good, at least compared to the Wacom one. Um, uh, nibs are like gold. Do you know what Sense Lab sends you? They send you a nine. That seems like a pretty odd number. They send you nine nibs, right? Four of which are felt. I've already put one on the pen. So super, super useful. Uh, all right, so you have all of your tablet mode. Also, you have this precision mode and your switch to di displays. You can set this to be whatever on these three buttons. And your mouse, you can set like pressure curves and everything on here. Uh, and a razor, you have like, so here's another thing that I find difficult with tablets is double clicking or like if I'm, if I'm opening something, right. And I wanted like to keep your mouse that still, like I find I'm, I drag quite a lot accidentally, but I just have like a double click button that double clicks for me. So that's super useful. And then the thin pen is a separate pen. Like it recognizes the difference. Pro pen two gets recognized as a thin pen. So if you are going to use your Wacom pen with the sense labs, it comes up as a thin pen. All right. All right. Um, Carol, when you started out back in 2009, you bought a space navigator from 3d connections. I also very nearly bought one of those actually, uh, a long time ago, actually probably around 2009. That's funny. Um, used it like 10 times since then. Yeah. It's one of those things that you like think like, oh, I can use this all the time. It's going to be so useful. It's going to revolutionize my work. So, so yeah, probably not. Actually, mice are just very good already. Everything's been designed around being able to use mice. Yeah. Doppelganger. So with, um, with drawing, I prefer drawing on a screen or sculpting on a screen, but as part of a workflow, multiple devices becomes quite inconvenient. Um, so you can be a lot more precise with your screen. I really, I have a small iPad pro, like, um, I don't know what size this is, but it's the, like, uh, it's like the, this, the, this one, the not 12, 0.9 inch one. I don't know how big that is. The not big one. Um, and that's really good actually for sculpting, but it's also portable. Like this is not inconvenient to move around and to position. A Cintiq is just, is very annoying. <laughs> so annoying. Uh, John, the company that puts a wheel on their pen will win your heart. Get one of the Wacom airbrushing pens. Uh, Wacom Airbrush. I'm pretty sure these have a wheel. Look at that wheel. That is a wheel, right? It's not just a button, is it? Yeah, it's a wheel. Go, go, go get yourself one of the airbrush pens and they'll, uh, and then you'll have, you'll have a wheel. They also look super ergonomic, actually. Maybe I should get one. Oh, no, they are expensive. Let's close that before I make a mistake. Right, uh, let's get, we're just going to be working on cubes. Let's um, make a new collection. Call it rocks. Uh, call it rock stack. No, what were you going to call it? Ah, oh, we'll just call it rocks. Um, and then I need another one for the rock stacks themselves. Uh, maybe I will nest those. All right, so rocks. Uh, whatever. I just I know that I'm going to be adding a collection later from the botanic one, which will be called rocks. Okay, cube. Here we go. Is it not spring sprung <laughs> or something like an actual airbrush? Oh, is it just a, a thick, is it just a long button? Maybe. 
Yeah, maybe it is actually. All right. Um, I've never used one of those airbrush pens, so I'm regrettably uneducated about such things. Let's go in here. Uh, I don't sculpt in Blender, so apologies if I'm about to embarrass myself. Um, right. So I think, is it Control R? There we go. Control R is remesh. Um, that'd be fine. All right. Uh, clay strips, because that's really all you want to use. I will just make a bunch of these and then we're going to scale them to one by one by one. All right. Um, don't have to really worry too much about what shapes you're doing. You're just going to make them look kind of rocky. Bring up some uh, references in here. So I'm just... One thing as well, actually, that I found with... Sorry, I'm just going to mention this about the Sense Labs thing. Um, is I needed to have the... Wait, there's a setting for it. Navigation, input. Here we go. I had to set it to WinTab instead of Windows Ink, which I know is a bit weird because this should be like for old tablets. Um, but yeah, the Windows Ink one I just was having loads of difficulty with. Same in, uh, same in Critter. And I might have actually, it might have been a problem of like conflict between my Wacom drivers and my SenseLab drivers, but it seems, seems fine anyway. All right, so I'm just taking off some bevels, making some shapes in here. Might try and like bring this one in a bit. You can tell I don't sculpt. These are all going to be remeshed anyway um, and eroded with additional nodes. So the idea is really just to make it um, into a different shape, basically. Let's make a bunch more of these cubes. Do that. There we go. Let's just do five and then we'll do. Why well, use voxel remesh and not Dintopo? Dintopo is a little bit slower. Uh, and it's not actually really that useful for now, uh, just because I'm just doing like general reshaping. So it's just a bit quicker for me to come in to sculpt mode, uh, do control R and now I can just sculpt it, right? Let's just kind of break up the shape a little bit. Just trying to lose some of these edges, make it feel a little bit less like I'm a rock. I mean, I'm a cube. <laughs> All right. Uh, the quads don't really matter either because we're going to be putting it through a remesh modifier. I don't know if having quad topology makes remeshing faster or if it's just completely immaterial. Um, but yeah, we will be changing the shape of all these. So these don't need to be super high poly sculpt because we're going to be losing all of that anyway. Um, and then a lot of it will be added back in through the shader. Hey, and I'm just asking, is Erin explaining all of the new geometry nodes now? Not really, just because there aren't actually so many. I mean, feel free to drop in chat specific nodes that you want to know more about and I will have a look at them or if I don't know them and otherwise I'll just tell you. Uh, let's make this come in a little bit. No, oh, right, that's probably fine. I'm trying to lose some of that shape a little bit. All right, let's go into this next one. Can you not like control onto one of these? Let's go to this one. There we go. Uh, control R. There we go. If I say, 
Uh, we're making a winter landscape. Can't you tell from the thumbnail? Uh, can you tell us about lymph nodes? <laughs> Are they the ones in your armpits and your neck, right? They're, they're part of your adrenal system. Uh, do they produce estrogen? Is that right? Sorry, my biological understanding is very minimal. Um, it's funny, actually. I was thinking about this the other day, like, what is the point of all of this stuff that we learn in school? Because, like, I learned a little bit of human biology, but not really, like, enough that if I was in the wild, I could actually keep myself alive. Not enough that I could do first aid on myself. Just enough to get through an exam. Um, and immediately forget everything. Like, surely, surely they should be teaching something about, like, you know, if they're going to give you such a cursory understanding of biology anyway, which they do it, like, when you're 15 or 16, why not give you something which is useful? Like, here's what happens if you drive your car off a bridge and you're trapped and you don't want to die of exposure. Like, that would be, that would be useful. That's survival training, it is, but like surely an understanding of human biology comes into that, right? Snow is a foreign concept in Australia. <laughs> we we get very infrequent snow here in the UK as well, don't we? Although actually my sister's just moved up north, up into Scotland, and uh, she sent me a picture of some snow, like snow. I, I get that it's January, in Scotland, so there is going to be like a lot of snow. I remember one of my friends went to Glasgow Uni and uh, a, a cinema near them while they were there, the roof collapsed because of the weight of the snow that came down. She's just like crazy. Yeah, we definitely don't see that much down here in Lancashire. Can you do transfer object mode with alt? Q, wait, what? Alt, Alt Q? What to this? Oh, you're joking. That is such a useful shortcut. Does this work for everything or is this just sculpting? Alt Q, my god. Okay, I need to like always do everything I do on the stream so that people can help me. Hmm, yeah, thanks, Doppelganger. I'm a, I'm not like a sculpting aficionado, as you can tell. These are getting worse and worse. All right, Alt Q, all right, Alt, Alt Q, there we go. Control R, let's just knock off these corners. Let's maybe just do this one a little bit more cube shaped. knock in a few bits. All right. Cool, that'll, that'll probably do us. Actually, I need to make sure I'm doing the backs as well because he's going to be rotated randomly. Um, yeah, that's good enough. Cool. Object mode. There we go. Put my tablet away. Awesome. It works for edit mode too. For switching, um, for switching things. Oh damn, it does. Yeah, that should definitely be taught more. That's very useful. Um, Alt Q, yeah, right. Let's make all of these down to one by one ish. Uh, it should be around about 0.5 scale. It's mostly the Z that actually matters for this because that's how the stacking is working. So I'm just going to make sure these are all brought down to Z1. All right, something like that is fine. Apply those scale and rotations. Come back over here. We can now grab our rock pieces collection, go to our instances, 
separate and reset because we need to be coming back to the zero position. Pick instances so that we're getting a different one per thing. Hmm. Let's make sure this subtract is, I think, causing some problems. So what does this look like after we remesh as well? Pretty good. And we need to make our Rockify a little bit better, but Kind of looks like a can. Can? Can? Can, I guess is right. Um, okay, let's plug in our seeds as well. Let's make sure we got the seeds for everything controlled. That'll be fine. Instance index we need to randomize as well because we need to have that like randomized, um, randomized thing. Random value. integer between 0 and 100 is fine. We'll just get a 4. I'm assuming it cycles, but just in case. Um, yeah, we need on our Rockify, let's have a look in this one. We need to make sure that we are not doing anything too crazy for scale. And actually, I'm just going to control all my scales together here with another another node. a bit smaller. I just want like general rock crack shapes, you know. There we go, something like that is probably fine. And then let's add some of that noise back in. Still going very slow. Uh, point 0.1, point 0.05. Cool, all right. Let's get these rendered. One thing I do like about these um, these materials from Materialic is you can see we've already got normal masking being built into them. You get like more, more moss on the top levels. Uh, we're actually gonna be using snow anyway. So in this case, probably doesn't matter too much, but it might be nice just to kind of have some of that breaking through. Um, this is looking pretty cool. Let's maybe go a little bit shorter, like uh, 15. And I guess we probably also want to randomize the the X and Y position a little bit per slice because at the moment they're all just in a very, very straight up and down stack. To do that, we can just randomize X and Y. Let's just do that with a couple of random values. Or, yeah, no, that's fine, okay. Okay, now a seed. Let's make sure that we are going from like minus one to one. Might also add just some value just to this seed, just to make sure it's different. Um, and I want two of these because I want them to be doing like not just a straight X and Y translation, as you can see this is doing right now, just because this is, it's all going in that direction. Um, these have the same seeds, so I'm just gonna change that up a bit. Change that to some other random value, there we go. I feel bad for people come in thinking, <laughs> thinking else are in geonodes. They should, people should know better. We, uh, yeah. All right, um, these are obviously way too far out. Far out, dude. Point five, maybe? I don't know how much of an offset we really want to have. 
maybe even less, um, 0.3. Why didn't I use my own nodes? Then I could have had these bipolar. I wouldn't have to do all of these. Minus 0.3 to 0.3. There we go. All right. Need a bit more sad rotation. Pervine, we're going to be making a winter landscape. I was just having a play with the accumulate node because we wanted to have a little bit. It's a new node and I wanted to make some stacks of rock and some landforms. <laughs> we're going to be making a bit of an environment. Um, let's just make this way higher. All right, there we go. Got a little bit more twist on some of these. Looking beautiful. Beautiful. If I move this. And let it update, there we go. A different stack. All right. I might make this a little bit less. Cool, coolie cool cool, let's go. Rock stack, done, 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 done. Landscape, sculpt, and then nodes, all right. So for now, I'm just going to hide my rock pieces and I'm also going to disable my rock stacks. I'm going to, yeah, let's do it this way. We're going to go just with a random, a regular plane. This is going to be our landforms. And then I'm just going to proportionally add it. Um, I'm going to scale it up big enough that we can create a bit of a composition. So that's 20 meters long by 40 meters deep. Let's just do that. Let's add a subdivision surface. I'll just apply that. Wow, that's a lot of points. Um, and then I'm just going to press O. It's going to give us proportional editing. Just have it set to smooth. Uh, I should probably add in a camera as well. So let's do, let's do that. Make sure we have this in our camera collection. Let's also set this up with some, try to work out what aspect ratio I want. Ultimately, this is just going to be shared on social media, so I guess square is fine. Don't want to go too portrait because otherwise we get, I don't know, I just, I want it to have enough kind of landscapeness. So let's go, let's go something like this. Coming down. Cool, very difficult to actually know what we're doing. About 1.5 meters for a human eye height. Right. I'm just going to go into my layout so I can set this up separately. One for my camera, one for my modeling. Um, I think it'd be nice to have a little bit of a kind of furrow in the foreground, a little bit of that kind of space. And then we can have like mounds kind of coming up on the sides. We obviously want to have the rock stack formations, which I think are going to kind of Come in. Do you know what? We need this. We need a bit of space, don't we? Sixteen nine does feel more realistic and postcardy, but posting a sixteen by nine on Instagram means that you actually have like, you know, that much space that you've reserved on somebody's screen, which can be a little bit of a nuisance. Although you can do 16 by 9 and then obviously crop for Instagram, so we could do like a, we could add some safe zones to our camera. So let's do um, uh, 16, 1920 by 1080, but I'll do a 200% render, so we're doing it like 4K. Can we do safe areas manually? Um, let's just do this like this. There we go. Make this square for the safe area. There we go. 
now we can see what we're working with and I will also increase my focal length sorry decrease it to make my field of view wider um, so for this we're gonna go with 30 something like that all right so that basically brings us back to where we were on that central section okay let me get a look at some references Oh, do you know what? So I just came across this guy as well. I keep finding his work on Instagram. He's like one of the most beautiful colorists. No, he's not a colorist. A beautiful. He uses. He has a really good sense of color. <laughs> he's a really beautiful painter. Uh, just oh, just these colors. Real good sense of light, light and dark, light and warm and cool within the same value range as well. Super important to do this. So this is something with painting that I really want to start being able to use with renders. Not today, because I haven't worked out how to do this, but what an amazing painting. So beautiful. Oswin, so the safe area, it's not, so safe areas you generally do for printing. I'm just using it here because this is like kind of the safe area for my crop, because I'm going to post this on social media and I want to have a, if we're doing 16 by nine, I also need to make sure I have a square crop section for social media. Um, I mean, you can see here, like, he's done this as a square painting. And there's a reason for that. It's because you can post it on Instagram and get more attention while still having, you know, it's not so portrait that you're making it inconvenient for a landscape. But um, Cool. Anab, good night. Thanks for tuning in. So what I'm after... I mean, this would be beautiful, but we want to get some rock stacks. So I think we need more of a, I don't know, need that, more of that kind of Utah landscape, don't I? But to just snow it up later. bring this in and we can do it all together and <laughs> blender renaissance the thumbnail you know i just it's it's descriptive you know we're making winter and we're doing it with notes so elsa is our <laughs> is our way through that do you know what? maybe something like this a river but obviously snowed over some trees because we have that but obviously they'll be like just winter trees, uh, some rock formations, and some big old cliffs. That might be a pretty cool way to do something. We can maybe add a little bit more of a rock cliff in the foreground, maybe with some like trees coming over. Um, I was thinking about doing the roots, but these, I guess, you know, you don't have such significant root structures where you have this sort of land form. Because obviously, you know, roots and rocks don't go together. All right, I think this is probably what we're going to go for. Generally, anyway. That's cool. All right. Let's see if I can find that one again. Hey, TT, how's it going? Check out Stephen Fedorovich. That is not a very memorable name. Making vacation plans. Oh wow, these are cool. When was he painting? These don't look recent. This looks like seventeen hundreds. It's actually pretty recent. Twentieth <laughs> century. Oh, these are nice. Oh, I guess because, you know, Russian, Russian snow, Russian winters. The 
these are cool. So um, Botanic has winter trees, which I'm going to be using a lot. Uh, I don't, obviously, I want to get the rock stacks in that we've been making. These are beautiful. The, the colour is going to be an interesting one. I need to work out a, a proper workflow for creating painterly renders. Because I, I feel like it's got to be a combination of shaders, cards, and compositing. It's not, you can't really just do it on one. And obviously then your modeling and your UV unwrapping have to be aware that you're doing it for this process. These are nice. I like this one, patchy snow. That's good. We can do something like that because we can weight paint our snow. That's not a problem. Cool. All right. Yeah, very little sky. I need, um, the thing is they've still got, the, because they're painted, right? Let's, um, we want to shift our camera down, basically. I'm going to do that. Um, there we go. So we still have our verticals, pretty much vertical. Um, if I add in a cube, you'll see that. Actually, do you know what? Let's make sure our camera is actually we go, 90 degrees. That's what we're after. And then our, our shift comes in. So you can see our verticals are now vertical wherever we put them. So if we want to rotate it later, we can still do that. But our framing has now been fixed. Thanks, uh, thanks Darren, for pointing that out. And we're just doing that with the shift Y on the camera. You can actually see the camera is now offset from its origin. Cool. All right. Um, let's come back in here. I'm basically, because I'm not really to, I'm not, I don't want to stress too much about this. So I'm basically going to take somebody else's composition um, and then use your own elements. I think that's kind of, you know, everybody in art does steal stuff to a certain degree. I think obviously you have to be careful at what limit you go from stealing to <laughs> using your own work. Um, but if you're not sure about composition, go and have a look at a bunch of stuff and be like, okay, I want to draw winter landscapes or model winter landscapes. Like what's going on here? We have these big expansive snow areas with some focal points, big expansive snow with some focal points. And we have a river coming through. Uh, the reference that we're interested in is something like this, right? Where we have kind of a big expansive space, but we also have cliffs and, but we're being led through the kind of the gully by this river. So we can do something like this. And it's just kind of trying to identify like, how how is the shape coming around? Are we doing the, I think it's called like the steel, steel mill or something. There's a bunch of different concert, um, Things. I've actually got a book on, I wonder if I can even find it now. I've got it on my, I've got it like a PDF. Um, called, oh, here it is, first place. Um, Edgar Payne. It's a really good book, Composition for Outdoor Painting. If you're interested in doing environmental stuff, I recommend that you do, that you read this book. Read this book. It's like really masterfully written. Uh, Edgar Payne was an old um, American landscape painter and it's quite wordy right obviously you're reading about um, composition and the kind of theory behind composition but he's got all of these which are like okay look, break this down break these down into your main like lights shadows and everything in between um, and he's breaking these down as well so we can actually see okay that's steel steel yard that's what we're talking about so we've got comfortable with the circle composition versus the steel yard, which is like single large things. Apparently it's just shift, shift and not tilt. Well, Quackles, you don't need the tilt because you can just set your f-stop arbitrarily short. Your f-stop is completely your own. It's digital. Um, is this public domain? That's a good question. I'm somebody sent it to me. I don't even know. 
Uh, I would assume not because it's probably not out of copyright. Edgar Payne. So there's probably questions about whether or not I should be streaming the pages. <laughs> uh, composition of outdoor painting. Um, published in 1941, so I I think it should still be in copyright. Um, but to be fair, if you just search the title of the book and then PDF, <laughs> it does come up with a link. So there we go. Yeah, it's just, it's a really good book anyway. If you're interested in this, I mean, obviously I recommend buying it, support the public, support, support the author, the author's dead, but I guess support the family of the author by buying the book. It's worth reading. It's, um, it's like, I don't know, 100 pages, 150 pages, you know, 150 pages about composition, colour, specifically on landscape. Um, yeah, anyway. Edgar Payne, Composition for Landscape Painting. Oh, sorry, Outdoor Painting, is that right? Tilt actually changes the focal plane. Ah, okay. So I guess it actually angles the focal plane, doesn't it? Anyway, right, so we want to have some kind of river running through some like focal point, maybe coming around. I don't really have a clear idea in my head, but I feel like we're also tilted or shifted too far down. It's come up a little bit. Uh, obviously we're gonna have like cliffs and stuff. Uh, might do, so we're gonna have like a general cliff formation in the background. Um, maybe something like this with a bit of a, I don't know, something coming through. Um, I want to have some like general, like some lower shelves that might have trees on them. And this river is way too elongated. So it's going to be much more like this, right? Much more compressed vertically. I don't know, we're making a landscape. Um, trying anyway. I'm, yeah. So I'm generally, I'm basing this like primarily for this square in the middle in terms of the composition. And that's just for, as all, as mentioned, the, uh, let's put a tree here as well, um, for the, for the Instagram crop. And we want some rock stacks cause we've gone to all that effort of making them. So maybe we can have like a small one here something like this and um, might also just add some pieces in here do you know what I might do because we're doing it with geometry nodes we can add in our rock stacks and then we can bring them into another object so that we can remesh them all together and then do all of our you know rockify and everything on a separate thing which means that we can do arches um, and other stuff as like custom additional mod, additional meshes, um, which just might be a fun way of working. Let's add another rock stack in here. Let's get that to like sort of frame our scene a little bit. Need like a bunch of, we can just like block this in with some blocks basically. Um, and I might also do something like this, like a low stack in the foreground. The goal is really that everything is pointing us into that space. All right, uh, a few more bits of like scrubland. Gotta get a river coming through. Can I make this not appear on one view? No, okay. That's really annoying. Um, we're going to just start off, start this off with some proportional modeling. There we go. Oh, great. That's so annoying. I want to turn off everything except from the annotations. Um, 
can I just that's so dumb that I can't you can't even turn off all of the overlays okay a boat maybe I think it's gonna be too compressed uh, we're sort of going for this like Arizona Utah desert kind of vibe um, so let's just it's just going to come in around these sides a little bit and grab those up in here. Let's get some other spaces coming in. Just doing a little bit of proportional editing. Edgar Payne died in 47. Oh, wait, was the book not? published in 47. I thought the book was published. In which case I guess it is public domain. Don't quote me on that, but uh, I think it's probably fine for you to download it. <laughs> uh, oh, is there a, there's like a draw shapes thing, isn't there? Awesome. Let's come in here and let's just draw some shapes. Did that work? Has it crashed? No, not quite. What is going on with these cubes? Does the draw shapes not work anymore? Add cube, yeah. I guess it doesn't. Oh, right, yeah, I could just do this one. Thanks. Uh, yeah, okay, it looks like we're going to be just blocking in with manually adding cubes. Uh, all right. Uh, one thing that we want is going to be to have some kind of shape coming in here. And then extrude this up and like scale it in a bit. And then I want to have, um, maybe I do want to sculpt this. Just thinking of our like intersections, or maybe, do you know what, maybe let's just, all right, let's do that. Cause then we can join it and remesh, that'd be fine. Um, Tilt shift. Yeah, I have a tilt shift lens uh, for real camera. Um, I didn't realize that. I guess I've not really thought about it. But um, yeah, my uh, my granddad used to do a lot of photography of churches. He used to travel around doing like Spain and get get church photos. So we've got a bunch of um, pretty neat photos actually that are all like tilt shifted. Of um, yeah. He used to use medium format, uh, medium format prints. Right. Hey, noodle time. Yeah, we're making a bit of a winter landscape. Um, I should have really come into this with more of an idea of what I was doing, but you know, live and learn. Um, I'm just going to sculpt this a little bit, I think. Or maybe I should just block in. I should finish blocking first, All right? <clears throat> Some of these are going to be rock stacks, so I can leave them. Um, we're going to be, let me just maybe sculpt some of this down a little bit to begin with. Oh, what? Okay, well, great. Now I'm in sculpt mode. This works. <laughs> no idea what was going on there. Uh, okay, 
grab it, sculpt, okay. There we go, nice. Looks like how normals are inverted, that's nice. Um, I just need to make a little bit of space in the ground, basically, for this river. Let's come through, need a bit more space on this patch, this patch here. Um, and we'll add in some of our rocks. Maybe I'll instance. No, I want to control it. I'm always torn between like how much proceduralism and how much manual and um, the the line that you draw like between oh, I'm just going to instance all these things versus like I need to actually you know have a bit of control over what's going on. Bless me. Um, yeah. Cool, that probably do us. Just do a recreation of one of my shots. I think I I actually ought to. I'm supposed to be um, doing, I, like, I was, well, Charon told me to do one Instagram post a week. Well, actually, I think he said once every two weeks, and I said I would do once every week. Uh, so, basically, I want to, like, create a piece of artwork each week. Because at the moment, I don't produce anywhere near as much work as I really want to. Like, I'm, I used to make a lot of work. <laughs> I, I just haven't really done that much anymore. Um... up. Okay, something like that. Uh, obviously all of this is going to be um, uh, sculpted as well. Maybe pull that back a bit just so we have a bit more mass. And then I'm going to grab another cube. Uh, I'm, I haven't used FSpy in years. It's been so long since I've used it. I never really particularly got on with it. I found it just quite difficult. Obviously, if you have to do camera matching, then it's good. But just, I always found it like quite a lot of faff to get it working how I wanted. Um, let's do something like this. People are wondering how I'm doing those quick extrusions. I'm pressing control and right click and it will allow you to extrude to your cursor. Kez, oh, thank you. Yeah, I don't really post much on Instagram. I need to, I need to, but it's kind of, it's dependent on me making work. So that is also what I need to do. I just need to produce more. I think that's the thing. Uh, it, it's easy to get as well, like into this negative feedback loop, especially with social media of being like, oh, I'm not, I'm not producing enough. I'm not being prolific enough. There's all of these other people who I'm seeing who are producing loads of work. And it's like, as long as you can keep yourself only accountable, like to your own, um, like to, to the level that you want to be at, I think that's all right. Just a quick thought, if there was any fight between you and CT Matter, who's going to win the full-on Geonodes battle? I don't know. A couple of months ago, I'd have said me, but he's actually, he's been getting really into it. Um, yeah, he used to ask me questions, like, how do I do this? But, uh, but not recently, so I guess, I guess he doesn't, I guess he's as good as, you know, he can do what I can do now. All right, I'm probably going to regret making all of this stuff and just... Um, any other landforms I need to make? I guess I can sculpt this one up, but I'll do that after I remesh. Um, I can add in a bunch of rocks, but again, I'll do that after I remesh. Uh, we need a bit of a background. Let's just duplicate this one down. Okay. 
There we go, just positioning stuff, whatever. <laughs> Quite cool things. <laughs> Let's join and remesh. And I'm also going to just take this end and I'm going to extrude it out. And I'm going to take these ones. Oh, I should be using that, that Alt Q thing. I? Okay, select everything that is a mesh. Control J. Uh, I can actually just do this in sculpt mode now. Control R. It's going to take a sec. Oh, oh, I just messed up. I think my remeshing is really, really dense. Oh, actually, okay. It seems to have not tried to do it based on the last one I did. That's good. Yeah, tinkering without a deadline. Pressure. I think it depends. Like, you should have... If you're tinkering without a deadline is something that you do consistently, I think then then you can produce a lot of really good work at a really consistent rate. Uh, I think one thing that I really struggle with is that I don't give myself a deadline and then I don't make anything for months sometimes. It's been like, I don't know, two years since I've like drawn something. And that's a really long, that's like a long enough that I do not have that skill anymore. But that's like a skill that I really want to have. Um, so I need to, you know, I need to get back into doing that. Ellie, oh, thank you. Or Eli, sorry. Did my tablet just run out of battery? Please don't do this. Oh no. <laughs> I just turned it off accidentally. There we go. So I need to like smooth out a bunch of this first. I'm going to smooth out some of these intersections as well by just adding some mesh to them. There we go. And then smoothing. This is probably not the best way to do it, but hey ho. And uh, we'll be like, we'll be noodling the rest of this. I'm not going to, this is not going to be a sculpting stream. We're just going to be, um, we're just like generating a basis for what we want to make. I think that's really like the way to use not like the way to use sculpting obviously a lot of people their entire workflow is sculpting and that's great but as like procedural artists I think having some skill that allows you to uh, to manipulate stuff manually is well worth uh, it's well, well well worth building up I'm kind of my inside something Just gonna layer in some marks. All right. Um, probably don't need to do too much in the background there. Just smoothing it. It's all gonna be materials anyway. Doing a lot of displacement. Uh, let's just make sure that we have enough. Um, enough of stuff going on in the foreground as well. I do want to have some little like low rocks and things. Uh, 30 days, 30 faces. Yeah. I mean, that was like, what, January 2018? That's three years, four years? Yeah, four years ago, right, that I was doing that. And I've essentially not, I've, I've barely drawn faces, barely drawn any portraits in that time. Um, other than, well, I, I draw, uh, like for birthday cards and things, I make joke caricatures of my family. <laughs> 
But uh, other than that, I like I haven't drew, drawn properly. You know, it's so easy to lose a skill if you don't, you know, don't use it and you'll lose it. So you got to make sure that you're, if, if you have a skill that you want to maintain, whether that's 3D art, sculpting, drawing, whatever, you have to keep pushing it. You have to keep building that skill set. Otherwise, you will just lose it. It's just, I mean, it's the same as everything, right? Cooking. Um, let's make this a little bit more coming around. I might remesh this once it gets too stretched. Just literally layering up until I've got a little bit more of that kind of shape in the background there. Um, I want it to come up a little bit more as well over here. And then we can start messing around with displacement afterwards. Uh, I just want to make sure that there's enough. Oops. Let's come down a bit. I want to have a several different like contours, like where it turns. Um, yeah, there's going to be geometry nodes basically. I'm I'm just I'm literally just doing this to have a basis, and then geometry nodes is going to handle the displacement to make it look more like rocks. Um, let's just make this slightly textured. I want it to have like a decent base. We're going to put snow over loads of it anyway, so it's all going to get smoothed out in places. Um, there we go. I just need to make sure as well that there is a river <laughs> coming down, a bit of a brook. So uh, let's make sure that we've got some things. I might also add a rock in here. And let's smooth this out actually, that's really, really rough. Give it a bit of a lip on top. Okay, something like this. That's sad to hear. Well, I mean, if you look at my work though, I mean, just, you know, talking about the losing the drawing skill, if you look at the work that I've produced this year, right, 20, already started the 2021 stuff, like just have a look at the top nines that I've posted. Um, that work is like so much better than the previous year, right? Because I've been dedicating basically all of the time that I spend working to improving my skill set. So I will be able to rebuild my, like my drawing ability. It'll take some time, obviously, but it's something which is not going to be impossible for me to do. Um, and then, yeah, it's just uh, it's just a case of like finding the time to do stuff, you know. Because I, I was working out really that I spend about, you know, I work like sixty or seventy hours a week, so I'm already doing quite a lot of like spending quite a lot of time building stuff and making tools, writing out content, doing stuff like that, designing courses. So I'm spending like a bit of time to make stuff. Um, let's kind of close in some of these. A little bit, get a little bit of an overhang going. I was going to say that we were going to do this with displacement, but I just, it seems like something that's going to be quite difficult to get correct without that proper edge angle stuff. Um, without a signed edge angle, that's what I'm meaning. All right, let's bring this in. All right, something like that. Um, where's that one? I feel like we want to pull out some rocks here. Um, I might duplicate some of my rock stack pieces. Um, Drawing skills will come back very fast, like riding a bicycle. It's true. I mean, the thing is, I still have the theory. You know, I've been like studying art and pushing my kind of visual language and abilities for the last 20 years, pretty much. Like since I was a kid, literally since I was a kid, I like, constantly, this has been like one of the main things of my sort of identity has been like, you know, what, what visually can I make? So... 
there's a lot of like things I've read, lessons I've taken. So yeah, I'm not massively worried. I just need to actually spend the time to fix it. Um, Okay, something like that, that's probably fine, it's whatever. Might know. Let's make that rough. Oh, we even got that in. I didn't even realize this was like in the composition. Let me just go into edit mode. Um, and I'm just gonna C gives you brush selection. I can just select all of this and I can pull it out of my view. Oh, I have snapping? No, I don't, that's fine. Let's just wait for Blender to uncrush. Oh, how often do you save while working on a project considering you are using the unstable, unstable, it's pretty stable. Blender doesn't really crash that much, um, right? <laughs> Has it just crashed? Oh no, that's fine, okay. Uh, let's make sure we close out that tool. Yeah, so um, once every 30 seconds, maybe? I mean, I do just save a lot. You learn to save a lot. Am I moving that? I can hear my CPU spinning up. Some skills, some skills overlap with drawing in 3D, but not a lot. I mean, it's, I think, that's terrible. <laughs> I think with drawing in 3D, there's, there is kind of enough that overlaps um, in terms of like the, like understanding composition, like you don't have to relearn composition. Or if you're a sculptor, you don't have to like be relearning anatomy and stuff like that right but it's there is for sure like a lot of stuff which doesn't really follow over um um but that's really just like muscle memory like how much are you uh yeah that's really just the muscle memory stuff Okay, let me just scrub that up a little bit. Okay, this is, this is fine, I guess. It's not too terrible. Might move the camera. That's enough sculpting for me for one day. I'm so bad at it. Uh, I think having... Having a lot of... Having more of an idea when going into a project is, like, one of the important things. And I think this is something that drawing gives you. Uh, if you're If you're not a drawer you won't have a chance to take ideas from your head and put them straight down on paper with, you know, those, for me to draw something with a pen or a pencil, I think of the shape and then I make the shape happen. I don't have to go through a bunch of different tools to be like, okay, I need to make this shape and I need to move these points over there to like change it. Because by the time you've done all that, you've changed your perception of what it is that you want to make. It's no longer like, yeah, I don't know, it's just, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like as uh, yeah it's just like it's not as fresh you know now a little tip for you as well if you're cleaning up high poly models like this and you want to just delete a whole bunch if you are same same for like photo scanning as well come in control right click and drag you can see here that i'm just able to like grab everything and just select it like that. Lasso selection tool. Very useful. Hey Sahil, how's it going? Uh, and the great thing about doing this is uh, as well, like you can, you can make all of your selections. You can see how high res this is. Uh, and then any islands you can just delete. So you don't have to be super accurate. Like all of this section on the bottom is going to be disconnected geometry. So we can just, you know, have that get deleted naturally. Don't need any of this. 
Don't need any bit. I'm basically just trying to reduce the amount that geometry nodes needs to process. Don't need any of this either. This actual end piece is not on camera. Um, just going to make sure that there is a little bit here just so I can disconnect this back piece without selecting it. And I also want to come in here. I want to create an island for these parts as well. Before I delete it, I will um, go into edit mode, uh, into camera view, just so I can see exactly what I'm doing. How did you learn anatomy? Draw. Draw as much as you can. I mean, that's really the only way to learn what anything looks like, in my opinion, is to study it. And the best way to study what something looks like without having the opportunity to make assumptions is by drawing it. So I would always say drawing is the best medium to learn. Um, is that pretty much connected? Good camera view, can't see any orange, that's good. Um, let's grab our paintbrush tool again, just come in and join these sections up just so I can get rid of any erroneous islands. Anatomy for the Artist by Gino Barksy. Hey, Spicy Melon, how's it going? Is that connected? Kind of. There we go, that'll do. All right, delete vertices. Now I can select this top one by pressing L and then Control I to invert the selection X to delete vertices zero. There we go. Now we have everything, but we don't have everything extra. All right, this is fine. Let's go back into geometry nodes. I'm actually just gonna delete all of that annotation. And we want to create a little bit of a system of um, of eroding, of erosion. Why don't you box select from camera view and invert? Because you can, uh, it doesn't always select everything that you need. Uh, sometimes you can end up with holes and then it's like, I mean, I could have just selected and then like control plus, 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 plus a few times to expand. Um, Um, spicy melon, that will happen as soon as we get solvers, physics solvers and loops that you can just plug the frame into the the, the loop count. Um, Alright. Uh, also, people saying about, about you know, deleting everything in the view. What about shadows? You know, if I deleted... Oh, you're right, I do have that, actually. If I deleted everything, uh, just from the view, then you would get no like. You know, if I just wait, let's come in here. Just box select slightly bigger than the view. It's going to select all of this, but you can see that there's so many holes, <laughs> and then I can still like. Um, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, Control plus or whatever to expand that selection, but it's still, I don't know, it's still kind of messy. Um, let's set this without camera again, there we go. All right, geometry notes. This one is going to be our erosion. We need several different kinds of erosion because we need cliff erosion and we need flat surface erosion. I wonder if there's a way to actually smooth out with geometry nodes. Um, anyway, let's just start with the Voronoi scatter. Sorry, Voronoi displays. Something like that. We're going to control the strength by the normal direction. Um, so this is going to come out with a map range. This is going to come out with a dot product. And this is going to come out with a normal 
there we go. Zero zero one. We are going kind of in the opposite direction actually. Um, so to minus one. Oh wait, not to minus one. From Something like that is fine. All right. I want to change the scale, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the scale of this. So vector math. Uh, multiply. And then position. So we want to get some of these like edges, you know. And we can now just reduce this strength a bit. And let's go into rendered view just to begin with. Should probably also add a custom environment let's use the sky texture just so that we can actually control this um let's bring up a shader editor world and sky and then here we go kind of know what kind of um, where to like cast the light from going for winter so a lot of it's going to be white anyway it'd be quite nice to have something in the sky visual of like visual interest maybe I could just go for like a winter HDRI to begin with just until we know what's going on here. Um, HDRI. Uh, one of these. Also, if anyone's interested, uh, Sketching in Blender has released a new video today, creating Rivendale in Blender. I recommend if you're interested in somebody who actually knows what they're doing with creating big scenes check out sketching in blender i will link them in the chat there you go yeah their work is amazing um let's do that as well I do want to have a bit of like a red sandstone uh, texture. Let's see if there's anything on ambient CG. I think it's such a shame that they changed it from CC0 textures to ambient CG. I guess maybe they want to start doing cell, um, like licensed um, uh, things as well, but. Redstone. My internet might dip a little bit just while this is downloading. Um, let's come. Let's go for sandstone as well. No. Okay, nothing for that. So I've got my texture. Let's bring this over. In a new window. This needs to be a texture, it's a natural texture for the floor. So ambient occlusion, color displacement, 
roughness. They can go into that. And then should have, uh, I should just be able to bring these into my shader editor. I was going to do it with the materialic thing, but actually I don't think there's a red sandstone. So there's a, we've got to just do this ourselves. Uh, control shift T. Um, I don't know if this actually works at the moment. The node wrangler control shift T shortcut for uh, bringing in an entire principle to set up. Natural uh, red. Where's this one? Rock 29. these in. Oh, there we go. Cool. That actually worked. Although it's trying to do it on UVs and nobody uses UVs anymore, right? Um, I need the basher node. So let's go and append. I was using the node presets add-on for a while, uh, but it doesn't seem to work anymore. It's a shame. So uh, blender node presets basher. Yeah, that channel, he's so good. He's so freaking good. It makes me just want to, makes me want to do more work like he does. Yeah, I recommend having like a proper look through his stuff and just, cause they're so easy to watch. And like if you're just like having lunch or something, just put one on. They're not hard going videos. Um, shade smooth. a little bit better and that background tree displacement I guess we're going to want to have if we turn on displacement in here So that's still too small. Um, point two, maybe point three. There we go. That's kind of rocky. Um, hey, Derpa, how's it going? We're just making a bit of making a bit of an environment, or well, trying to, anyway. Uh, I want to bring back my rock stacks. I want to make a few of these. Drop them in the scene. We're going to have to change that material for my redstone, which is fine. And all right, so um, we, uh, what are we doing? Yeah, it looks so simple, but when you try it, there's a that's that's the thing with like professional people who are seasoned professionals, right? He's a concept artist they really do have a workflow, like just copy them, just copy exactly what they do. And then you will start to get a sense of like, oh, you know, this workflow of doing this block in in this way and then doing this and then doing the post work, like that really works to, you know, to build stuff up. And the post impressionist Voronoi era, everything's Voronoi. Okay, so we've got a rock stack. Uh, I need to make sure we're going to make a bunch of rock stacks and we're going to, oh yeah, that's what I said. So what we're doing is instead of having remesh and rockify in one, what we're going to do is we're going to make a new collection in here called stacks and we're going to make our stacks, but we're going to put them in this collection. Then we're going to have another another object which simply takes that collection. So these are all stacks. So 
that going to work? I think it should do. Yeah, maybe. I'm just trying to think about when we realize, because I, I want to keep things as simple as possible. As soon as you realize, things get heavy. Um, <laughs> Blender ruined your life. It's so funny when you start getting into shaders, I think especially, uh, you'll be like walking down the street and you'll look at a door and you'll be like, wow, that door is so intricate. I really want to like grab a picture of that door. And then it's like, I'm not just grabbing a picture of the door. I'm like grabbing a picture of the texture of the door. And somewhere in my head, we're going like, okay, so like the Voronoi, but then we're using like a noise thing to mask out different Voronoi cells so that we can get the, the crackle. So it looks like the paint's properly peeling. Such a mess. You just get really like overrun with CG workflow. Um, so this one has a node tree which is stacks. And we're going to set to relative. So all of our stacks are just in their original positions. is so stupid but this is one of the problems that we face with only being able to output a single object per object geometry nodes it's a bad system I'm sorry it's not a good system you should be able to output multiple different objects for example I want to output my realized stack of things plus the position of my stack of things as two separate things but uh there we go so we've got our stacks here, uh, separate and reset fine. We don't need to do that. All we want to do, not rock pieces, we need our stacks. If I come in here and grab my cube, I'm just going to mute that realize. I don't think I want it and I'm just going to position a couple of these just around shift D, let's make another one. Maybe you can go down there, something like that. Uh, maybe we have another one over here. I'm just going to pull it down through the surface. Um, actually, you don't need to because the surface is going to come up, but there we go. Um, there. <laughs> um, it's going to take a camera view these are all massive we're working at a weird scale aren't we um, I think these stacks must be huge let's come in here how big are these yeah 2 meter radius maybe let's make these a bit smaller especially this one because it's right in our face Let's go down to like much smaller. Uh, and our slice thickness can be a little bit lower. There we go, number three as well. Uh, let's grab you, pull you over here. George knows bring it down a little bit. Oh, that's completely out of sight. Um, <laughs> changing a brain seed value. Like, I don't just have a bad memory, it's just that my seeds changed. Right, let's bring this one down as well. Put it somewhere over here where we can see it a bit. Well, can we see it anywhere? Maybe we can build some of these into the cliff, actually. Would that be cool? Uh, shift D. The rock on top of the left heap. Yeah, I can move it. It's like totally about to fall off. Or do you mean like the left, left one? 
I just uh, there we go. Find one that's a little bit more plausible. These will get remeshed. It's fine. Uh, Got to go. The real world beckons. Oh, now unlucky. <laughs> that's the worst place. See you later. Thanks for tuning in. All right, let's bring this one down. Maybe our uh, minimum size is a bit bigger. I actually quite like the idea of putting some of these just like into the cliff a little bit. So let's just uh, duplicate them. Maybe this one's a bit taller and a bit bigger at the top. Just gives a bit more like shadowing or something on these. They'll all go and set them, set their materials. Anyway, uh, this one's too big, isn't it? Bring it down. There we go, something like that. All right, uh, so I can get rid of these stacks now. Now we have all the stacks in here, and what are we actually outputting? Can I do instances to points? Yes, I can. And what this means is now I have. Damn it, that didn't work. <laughs> oh, there we go, separate children. Um, so now I have the positions of each of these. Um, that will help me because it means I can calculate my distance from those points. I might need to also do points to vertices. We will see. Um, all stacks positions. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to do my geometry proximity to lift up the bottom, right? To lift up the ground, but not, uh, but not have to evaluate all of the vertices of my stacks after they've been remeshed and all of that, right? So the idea, at least, is that I can do this. Here we go, stacks. Uh, the idea is that I can do this and keep the computation fairly minimal. All right, there we go. Okay, so these are all instances. Let's realize these instances. And then we can rematch this. Um, yeah, and the good thing about doing this as well is that it means that I can add something. So let's say I wanted to have an arch coming down here. I could just come in here and I could add a cube. And I could just put this into my stacks collection. Uh, although I probably want to process it first. So I'm just going to take this cube. Wait, did I not just take it out? Let me just save. I feel like we might be about to crash because something has not just updated. Um, okay, we will see. Uh, and all I need to do is create a bit of an arch in here. And just come along, something like that. Cool. This maybe could be sculpted later. Wait, which cube did get pulled out? Cube 22? Okay, that's fine. Um, so we have this. I'll just rename this one to arch so that we can do this. We could either bring it in manually into this stacks group and just join it in. 
or I could just drop it into the stacks collection. Maybe. And what I might want to do actually is just have it so that my origin for this object is on that surface there, just so that it gets pulled in correctly. All right, I'm gonna turn off my stacks so we can see, still see this and grab my stacks, which are now remeshed and also have an additional geometry nose modifier, which is our rockify one, it turns them all into rocks. And this can also set our redstone material. So they're all being materialed together. All right. What is this? Is that ball my position, my point? I didn't think they got visualized. I guess it is. Yeah, it seems like Cycles now visualizes points. I feel like that never used to happen. Um, all right, uh, let's grab our points in that case and we can bring these into our landform over here. And I'm actually gonna do this beforehand, bef before the uh, displacement, I think. So we're gonna come in here, just organize these a little bit, bring in our stack positions, please don't crash. And if I visualize the output of this, that should be fine. Um, geometry position. Geometry, sorry, geometry proximity. Set position. We're going to be moving this in the global Z. We're just going to have a Z off, off, off set uh, with a combine XYZ. with the proximity for our distance, although we'll put a map range in here just for control. And our locations can be these points. Does that work? Kind of feel like it doesn't, but we will see. that does not work. Uh, I guess we need to go points to vertices then. So uh, point to vertices. Geometry has unsupported type mesh. Am I going crazy? Let's just turn these into vertices then on this side of things. There we go, that's done something. Uh, we can go to that. What is going on? Just turn off everything except for my land form here. Any update if snapping for nodes and 3D viewport will be separated in the future? I wouldn't hold my breath, to be honest. Um, obviously, it would be amazing if they were, and there's really no reason for them not to be, other than the complexity of actually doing that. Um, somebody should bring it up, actually, because we're about to go into Beacon 3 or 2 for Blender 3.1. So actually, um, we should mention that. Are there, are there any devs in the chat at the moment? Separate. Um, yeah, because I saw a patch from somebody actually who did it. I think it was on right-click select. Um, for yeah. There we go. Um, oh, Hans is here. Hey, how's it going? There is a patch to split them up. It's surprisingly complicated though. Ah, oh, that is a shame. Because it's so annoying having it turned on in both. It just really feels like they should be separate. Like from a user experience point of view, this is like a totally different editor paradigm to 3D. 
So it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel logical that you would snap in both. Um, right. Do I need to realize these? Is that what's going on here? very very troublesome that this isn't working um oh it's because i had it set to original not relative there we go so i want a little bit of a raise around each one um but really not by much we'll set this to smoother step coming up like this um now i guess the benefit of doing it based on the stacks themselves would be that it would be the, the appropriate scale for the stack. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. Um, what YouTuber do you recommend to start in sculpture? Jan Sculpts. Jan's great. Um, what am I making? I'm making a winter landscape. Can't you tell from all of the, the desert stone? I guess it's not going to show up. Um, yeah, it's feeling a bit more deserty at the moment than expected, but it's all part of the fun. Where are all of my stacks? <laughs> what? What's going on here? Oh, it's because that I. All right. Um. Turn off the stacks. So I'm thinking that maybe instead of this. We change this to stacks themselves, and then the ground's actually going to raise. I also need to make sure that this is clamped, though, to not raise on normal, like, horizontal surfaces. So let's stick something in here. Oh, I've already got one. Uh, let's just duplicate this one. Here we go. Um, if I do that... Now we can just do this on the top top faces. Zero to one. Oh right, because that's super low actually. Um it's kind of a it's kind of annoying either way. Maybe we just do it with the stack positions, as we were before, uh, but we just increase the distance a little bit. Go with like one to, or like point five to two. Colin Small, see you later, man. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get rid of this one. All right. So it's a little bit of a landform rise now around these pretty significant in some other places that doesn't need it. Hmm. Maybe we just paint it in the range. Uh, I know that's like super manual, but it might just be the easiest way. Um, let's grab a group input and we're going to set the distance on here. So we're going to have a different distance range like that, and then we're going to set the distance. Let's just stick a map range on here. So 0 to 1 is actually going to be like 0.2 to 3, maybe. There we go. And we'll just set this to zero. Let's just make a new group. Vertex groups, here we go. Weight paint. Let's 
So obviously getting some glitches with the fall off, I can tweak that in a moment. But just to begin with, just want to make sure that we've got a decent thing. It was really the, that <laughs> this bit here that I don't want to have too high. Uh, so we'll just set the weight down to like something nice and low here. Actually, that's the minimum, so I can just set that manually actually. Um, all right. Uh, 1.5 meters for the fall off, that should be fine. I'll pull these in a bit. Maybe we'll go a bit further. There we go, something like that. And there we go, I can control that small one as well. All right, now we want to instance a bunch of points. So we can instance some rocks on here. And then we can do some roots. Uh, all right, so this is for the screen. Let's just carry on with this bit. Uh, point instance, sorry, distribute points on places. In my head, I'm still working with like the original uh, node names. So this is fine to work on this bit. I need to make sure that my selection is basically within this distance, or maybe that should be the, the density. Let's, uh, let's just grab another map range on here. Got this just the same, and we're going from, so, so like 0.1 for general rocks everywhere. And we're just going to increase the number around our cans. Something like this. We might also just add we're still doing it like proportional to the previous one, but something like that is probably fine. Kind of messy, this node tree, but sort of readable. Uh, instance on points, pick instances. We're going to create a collection now with Botanic. Uh, so spawning some rocks, just going for these sandstone ones. These are pretty big, so I'll scale them down. Um, I'll just, I guess, bring them all in, or well, at least a few. Quite like how sharp they are, though. Wait, am I even? Yes. And that one, there we go. All right. They're pretty big, so we're going to scale them inside our no tree. Let's go back to this actually. Uh, land, here we go. Why don't you join this back up with our modified land? Gonna grab our rock scans collection, instances, separate, reset. Doing that, that's all fine. Um, way too high on the density, and these want to be scaled down as well. Something around here. Let's grab a random utility, random vector uh, for both scale and rotate. So rotation is going to be definitely actually. Do you know what? Probably fine to do this in all all axes, so they're tumbled, and then scale between, so we're aiming for like 0.15, or like 0.2, whatever, uh, we can just give these a bit of scaling, there we go. Something like that should be perfectly adequate. Um, right then, I want to put some trees around, and then we can start putting some snow in the scene. Uh, we need a little bit more displacement, really. Let's just add a couple more of these. So, general one, I do 
generally just like throwing Voronoi and stuff. I think it's like gives quite a nice effect. Just kind of gives you some definition right in the landforms. And then I'm also going to throw noise in here, just layering these up a little bit. down that scale, bring down the strength, and maybe just increase the distortion a little bit. Alright. This is all pretty subtle. Which is fine. Uh, do we need to maybe distribute our points on our displaced mesh? That certainly makes a bit more sense. They might also want to just generally move up a little bit. They seem like they've been absorbed way too much. Let's just stick a transform on. Yeah. Oh, maybe there aren't. Maybe there's just not that many rocks. That is fine as well. All right. Um, so I made an ice shader the other day that was pretty sick. It was like a parallax ice shader. It's just like standard parallax. So I'm going to use that for the river. Um, we're going to stick some snow in. Maybe some dead logs and some pretty, you know, sparse trees. And then we'll do a snow layer. We'll do the snow with geometry nodes, although we'll use the snow shader from that snow add-on. Alrighty then, uh, let's grab a, let's grab some trees. Uh, botanic, spawn assets, we're looking for winter specifically, deciduous trees, so they've dropped their needles. And these are just leafless trees, which is great for what we want. I don't know what kind of trees grows in the desert. Um, I'm assuming not oak trees. Oh, these, so many bots still coming through. Let's delete them. Uh, right, trees in the desert. Acacia and willow trees. Um, I don't know if we have any acacias. Because we want ones which are a little bit, let's just go for this ash. I know it's not really like desert tree. Oh, okay, everything, I'm just gonna scale you down. I know you shouldn't really scale trees. <laughs> you should just be working to the right scale. Um, but hey, I'm not. Uh, let's do something like this. Uh, cactus, cactus, cacti. The, um, the issue with doing cacti would be that they would really not grow in, they would grow in a desert for sure, but they wouldn't grow in a, uh, you know, like a, a desert with snow, right? I don't, I just don't feel like you would get them in a place which actually has winters. Uh, maybe you would though. I don't think there are any cacti in this add-on though. Willow trees. I'm kind of surprised that willow trees grow. Let's just let's search for willows. No willows? Are you serious? All right. Looks like we might not have any willow trees. Um, the Brazilian Cerrado. Oh, savanna. Yeah, that's probably what I'm talking about. Not desert. Uh, the trees are shorter and with more erratic trunks. Interesting. 
maybe stone pines. So I guess, I mean, really we want stuff which is like twisty, right? Twisty and short. Maybe this buckeye. Pretty sure there's a maple, isn't it? Buckeye maple. Um, I actually don't need too many. I may uh, just like one more. Um, I still find it hilarious that you chose a desert landscape for winter scene. Do you know why? It's because I've been watching Matt's off-road recovery on YouTube recently. I feel like everybody has. I think it's just like hit the algorithm. It's so good. I don't know where he's at, where he's based. It's somewhere in America in like a very deserty place. Um, I recommend it. It's just like good good kind of pulp content. Matt's off-road recovery. Oh my god, I just saw the thumbnail for this stream again. I'm so sorry. You just, they just do like extreme recovery. I'm going to drop this into the chat. It's good fun. If any of you need some just like trash to watch, but that's like still kind of fun with good people. Matt's off-road recovery. Get to see loads of desert car rescues. Um, all right. Have we got any others in here? Yeah, there's not a huge amount of diversity. If you're wanting like European environments, Botanica is great. If you're wanting elsewhere, you're going to struggle. Um, I think I just want to want an aspen. Probably not. Well, okay, this is just unnecessarily tall. Yeah, something like that is fine. Um, let's go back into solid view. Okay. I think this, uh, okay, I mean, I'm going to just add another plane in here. This is going to be our uh, water. Or ice, I guess. Whichever. Uh, make sure that we don't have any coming out of camera view. It's fine. Control A, rotation. Let me just append this. I've got a. I was thinking of somebody else, so a little bit cheeky for me to use it, but. Actually, was I doing it on. What am I looking for? Materials? Long way round, up, down. Yeah, you and McGregor and Charlie Borman. I love those. That's like, those shows are why I'm like so interested in getting motorbikes and just like generally two wheels. They're so good. All right, let me just save. All right, let's look at this. So this should be, if I've not messed it up, a proper parallax ice shader. Yeah, it is still good. I don't know if it's really clear, but you can, let me do an EV, that's probably a bit easier. You can kind of see that there's actual depth in this, uh, in this ice. There's like a top face and a bottom face. So that's pretty cool. I should really make more shaded tutorials. But yeah, this is fun. So this is our like ice frozen surface. We can maybe make it a little bit thinner. Uh, procedural textures. Where are we at? Uh, depth to there. Yeah, so we don't need it to be a meter thick. That's just, that's just crazy.
maybe something like that is fine. Maybe that's a bit too much data. Uh, oh wait, that's the min max. Sorry, me being dumb. So zero to one, and then we're going for. Oh, I was doing it this. No, let me just delete those. That's easier. Yeah, parallax is like so addictive. 0 0.3, 0 0.25, something like that. And then the top face can be like, just a little bit, just a little bit. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> the stone stuck in the ice. It should be better once we get some, uh, it's a shame you can't see the stone through it because this isn't actually like parallax. I mean, it's not like an actual thickness of a surface. It's just fake. Uh, so yeah, only from the shape. Do you know what else is cool? Right, you get this surface look, but if I just look at the color from one of these, like just the color, it still looks like ice. This is just maths bending the surface according to a noise texture. Crazy, crazy. <clears throat> anyway, that's working adequately. I think I have an asset actually for a broken log that I might try and find. I think that would work well here. So this is our ice shader. Um, I don't know if it's, I don't know what the licensing was on it. It's append. Can't remember where I used it either. I probably put it in here. Plants, maybe. Maybe these are all house plants. Um, and where else do we put stuff? Natural. Logs. Oh, this is promising. So we have Mossy Old Tree Log by Julian Malik. This is from Sketchfab. Let's bring in this ad, this object. Uh, I don't know what the licensing is, but it's uh, Mossy Old Tree by Julian Malik. It's just a nice little photo scan. I need to actually get out. We've got loads of logs in our garden because we had a we had a storm the other day and we had a tree down. Actually, two trees. And. Uh, I should really go scan them. I've got that new photogrammetry course from Glab. So freaking good. If you're interested in photogrammetry, get that course. It's amazing. Um, let's do this and pull this through the surface a little bit. I might duplicate it and pull it somewhere else as well. Save that as a append. I had another one in this folder. Pohutukawa tree by B. Neely. Again from Sketchfab. Let's see what this one's like. Except from huge. Um, it's quite a nice one. It's good and wintry. I think I actually didn't clean it up. Uh, maybe let's go and find boundary loops. And then control F grid fill. Can we do that? No, nope. let's just do F. It's not good topology. Uh, if I do this and then select boundaries. Cool. I think the rest of them are actually filled in. All right. Yeah. Does anybody else have any? Uh, does anybody have any New Year's? Uh, oh wait, Quackles. Are there any false books going software yet? Yeah. Meshroom by Alice Vision. 
Meshroom. Uh, so Hypersonic Monkey Brain says their goal for this year is to buy a new PC, get Corona, Octane, Lux, Cycles, and EV all running on Blender. I would probably just do Octane <laughs> or uh, maybe like Redshift or something like that. Like, you probably don't need all of them, but it's up to you. Uh, Leonard Productions, I'm surprised that Blender doesn't have a proper parallax node. There was, uh, there was a parallax build that had some parallax nodes in it, actually. But yeah. Does anybody have a New Year's resolution that they want to share with the class? I feel like New Year's is like a good time for us to... Obviously, most people don't keep their New Year's resolutions. Um, because it, it's difficult to uh, and there's not always the best motivations but are we getting the end of that texture? yes um, but yeah it's, a, it's like a nice thing to do to kind of try and clarify what it is that you actually want to do like for me, it's making a workflow about making painterly renders because I'm I'm sick of not having a, a a visual language in my renders. Like I really want to make stuff that's like identifiably mine, and I think this is a real problem that three D artists have. It's like we make just stuff all the time, but it's like it looks like a thing because it's the thing that we've made. It's too representational. I think that's the kind of the issue I have with it. I need more people to be doing more expressive, uh, more expressive works. Don't like that tangent, that's not good. SR, learn Houdini, yeah, that's a good one. A good thing, a good thing to plan for and to work towards. Uh, organize your work and start to share. That's a good one. That's a good one to work towards actually. Having like more of a kind of share culture is um that's really what like pushes Blender. Especially like the community in Blender is incredible compared to so many other platforms where you'll find that everybody is very just interested in making a quick buck. Um, uh, so the in Blender 3.1 you go up to the node editor overlays and turn on your timings so yeah it's just, it's just built in Julia looking for 3D jobs they are out there so just keep definitely keep going for them there seems to be a lot there does seem to be a lot of work i feel like 12 months ago there was actually more work i'm not sure if that's like true or it's just because i'm not really looking for it now but yeah you will find it um and i have no the same looking for finding a job Alberto, thank you for switching to Blender this year. Is it stable for big projects, all the studios? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, loads of studios use Blender. I use Blender every day. And I use it professionally a lot. Um, I was certainly using it professionally more a year ago. Um, although I guess what I'm doing is actually still professional because it's what I do for a job now. But... I was working like with studios and things, and we were using Blender. So there's a lot of studios which have moved to Blender as well. Cinema 4D is, they don't update enough. Hopefully this, hopefully the move to subscription has, will give them a financial impetus to increase their like update schedule. Darren, 
I read an article about how it's better to remove the word resolution and put in skill. That's actually a really interesting idea. So instead of New Year's resolutions, you're like, what skills am I adding to my repertoire this year? That's nice. Um, photo scanning. Um, yeah, more scanning this year. Yeah, I want to do more scanning as well. I kind of, I was doing scanning and then I stopped doing scanning because I guess I just saw a lot of this stuff, like the neural network stuff. Um, and I just kind of felt like, well, surely AI is just going to take over. Like surely it's going to get to a point where it's like, you just take a, a video or you take like five photos and the AI is going to rebuild the thing. So part of me is like, is scanning actually like a valuable skill? I don't know. Did I hide my plane? I seem to have hidden a lot of stuff. Oh, it's because I'm in local mode. There we go. Um, oh, thanks, Crackles. That's kind. I'm glad. I mean, to be fair, somebody else did also say before that I have like a style, which I find strange because it's like everything I'm making is still very representational. I think maybe I just do more like plants than some people. Oh, I need to scale this. How do I scale texture? Can I just do it in here? Oh yeah, I just do it. There we go. I've really got to think for it. Um, <laughs> Alex, learn maths. <laughs> Toya, thank you. Uh, Jap yeah, the lidar scanning. Uh, if I didn't, if I if I had a lot of money, <laughs> I would definitely get an iPhone. Even just for like the facial tracking, so I could. I've got some ideas for like VTuber stuff that would be loads of fun to do. Like live. Um, maybe I shouldn't even say this because it's. I don't want somebody else to steal it. Although I'm certainly not in a position to actually do it, so maybe it would be good if somebody else did do it. But um, like live book readings or scripts or whatever. But to do it in, um, in like, in a three D built environment, with a like a an avatar, like a live avatar, and you'd have like a bunch of them, right? And you'd just be there in your mocap suit, or you could even have like a bunch of different actors from all over the world, and as long as their like connection was good enough, it would be able to like update live, right? So you could have them reading scripts, or you know, you would read the script. And uh, you could switch out, it, like if you were just doing it yourself, you could switch out the character and you could switch out between different sets. It would be like doing like a one man theatre performance, but you would have all of the different outfits at like the press of a button. I don't know, I just think that sounds like a really fun, fun project. Although a lot of work and I have no time. <laughs> Erin is, <laughs> I am like prime waifu material. Don't know what you're saying. Anyone would be uh, lucky to have me. Uh, let's grab this up here. Oh my god, I can't get this in the right place. There we go. make that for the next game jam. Next game jam, somebody actually asked earlier, what, when's the next game jam? Uh, next game jam is in summer. So, yeah. The Intel RealSense cameras, they're more budget friendly. Yeah, are they good though? Especially second hand. Part of me just thinks, ah, oh, just get like a second hand iPhone 10, whatever, stick it on a helmet rig and you've got facial tracking. I bet that wouldn't be too much on eBay. Probably, hopefully. Um, all right, let's get some snow on the ground. So I don't know whether or not I want to do it on everything. Probably do. 
Um, so maybe we do this in another object. Let's pull these out of that botanic collection. There we go. Let's make a new collection to hold all of our environment objects. Uh, how did you learn so much about any about procedural modeling? Can you mention any books or blogs? No. I learned this all kind of off my own back. I just do stuff and then you know how to do it. I don't really, that's how you learn. <laughs> just experience. People ask for books so much and it's like, why waste? And it's not wasting, right? A reference book can be very valuable. Um, but it's like you, to, to get a book which is worthwhile, right? To get something like, to get a book like this, right? Parametric design for architecture and be able to use the information inside it. Cause this is all for 3DS, right? If I was to be like, oh, go and get this and just work through it. You would learn how, you would learn how to do a few things in 3DS. But in terms of like procedural modeling and workflow paradigms and things like that, like you're not gonna learn anything if you do that. You need to know how to do procedural modeling in your tool of choice before you go and read other things, in my opinion, right? Like, fi just find a project you want to do and do it. Uh, is there a way to scatter objects using geometry nodes on one texture? I have a single object with two textures. Do you mean two different materials? Like you've assigned two materials? Or do you mean literally like the textures within a material? Uh, Julia, do I know when the Linux and Mac versions of my size will be out? Oh, that's a good question. You should ask Brian, actually, because he's still got the project files. And he said he was going to do it in January. Um, I feel like he said he was starting work again on the 3rd, which is definitely in the past, so you should check. Um, yeah. Just ask him on Discord, I guess. So you do, so, sorry, yeah, you do have two separate materials. Let me just, you can just use the material index as a mask. Um, uh, if I run. put all of these into this collection so that I can use the collection to instance snow everywhere. Um, right, so if you have an object, let's say a monkey, and you've got two materials on it. So let's take this bit and we'll add two materials and assign that as a second way. So let's come in here, add whatever you can tell what's going on here we've got two different materials if I go into geometry nodes and I find my material material index node now I can use a point distribute points on faces and I can use the material index as my selection so and if you want it to be you can so just set this to equals right integer equals zero or one and now you can pick your instance locations by the material index. That's what I would do in that case. Cool. Um, bye, Suzanne. So we need to jump back into here. Oh no. Okay. I thought I was gonna have to wait a long time for the materials to compute, but we do not. All right, so this is gonna be our snow layer. We're gonna take all of our, we're gonna make a new geometry nodes, call it snow. We are going to grab our environment into here. And let me just turn this one off. I'm gonna set this to relative. We are going to go realize instances. Oh, this is gonna be a bad idea.
Um, alumna, hey, you can't solve a silver problem. How can you get the subdivisions from a mesh to behave like a grid which exists of curves? Um, so I get a curve for every loop cut. Oh, I think I see what you mean. Um, the difficult thing is that you've got your horizontal, that you've got your X's and you've got your Y subdivisions, right? In your thing, well, second. Okay, so you've got a grid. And so what you really want to have is like five lines in this way and five lines in this way, isn't it? But at the moment, I guess what you're getting is like, here's a segment, here's a segment, here's a segment, and so on. So what you really need to do, I think, is to separate your lines. If you're working in a grid, it's quite easy to work on, can you work in edge direction? Um, you basically just need to delete, basically you need to make a bunch of lines and then separately make another bunch of vertical lines. I think that's really the way to do it. Um, yeah, not super easy though. Uh, uh, right then, oh, turning back on snapping. It would be definitely beneficial to have that done as one. Uh, as, a, as like a separate snapping. All right, so we're gonna go point instruments, distribute points on faces. We're gonna make a bunch of things. Interesting, rock stacks. You need to come in as well. Oh, this is slowing down now, isn't it? Come on, Blender. You can do it. Okay, maybe you can't do it. Try that again. Winter landscape, let's go. So, come on. I need to get my rock stacks positioned in here as well. Go to that collection, rock stacks into our environment. There we go. Uh, what are your specs? I'm using a Ryzen 9 3900X, so third generation, uh, or is that second generation? Um, a an RTX 2070 Super, so 20 series, and a and 64 gig of RAM. Oh, is my cracks top and bottom are they in the same place? That's not very good. Let me just uh, offset those positions a little bit better. I think it was like just randomly perfectly aligned. Maybe I should rotate it as well. Um, I use the realize instances tattoo on a grassy field. That's like the worst case scenario is doing it on a grassy field. It's like the example I used to tell people not to do. Okay. It just takes so long. It's in the grass as well, it's like it's not even necessarily that low res. We've got some weirdness going on in here. Is this, have I inverted something accidentally? The 
something ain't right. It's like we've offset. We've offset something in a way I don't want to do. No, ah, it's fine. It's fine, whatever. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. Botanic we can turn off as... No, we can't. Um, that's fine. We can turn off lights, hide cameras. Cool. Okay, that's much cleaner. Let's make a new collection for our snow. Uh, even though it's only going to be one object. So name it snow. Make sure we're saving properly. Geometry nodes called snow. Bring in our environment. I'm not actually sure how much of this I need. To we'll find out. Let's set this back to relative. Do a points on faces. Do you know what that's pretty good? Um how it looks I am it looks pretty good. That seems fine, actually. Okay, we're not going to realize it seems to be doing an adequate job. Because we're not actually instancing a thing, we're turning these into volume. And then that's, just, that's just totally fine. So we can do points to volume, volume to mesh. Save what you're doing. Uh, TT, you cannot share a link. Uh, I don't set the rules just doesn't seem it like all comments with links automatically seem to get deleted um, hmm. try to use a line art for grass that was <laughs> just really anything for like doing stuff with grass it's like no maybe don't do that oh maybe oh separate. Come on, I want my snow to be consistent. Um, okay. Reduce this a bit. Realize instances. Gotta do it again. Control S. Oh yeah, link.com. Yeah, nice. You don't see the link uh, no, there is no link on our chats. Oh man, my shoulder is really crunchy. Okay, that is working, but good lord, is it taking a long time. Um, Fox of the Mount, we're going to change up to a 500. I was going to say a 1000, but let's go incrementally. Kind of off topic, but can you explain the new Raycast mode? The new Raycast mode? Node. Um, I can explain the Raycast mode, but just bear with. In general. Oh yeah. I, uh, I went to a place in Scotland that, well, I was cycling through it and there was just all of these cairns everywhere. People just stack up these rocks, it's cool. Um, yeah, you're trying to get a camera call to work in geometry nodes, but the ray direction thing is confusing. So, what, what you're trying to do, do you know what, let's open a new blender. We haven't really done any proper asides. Um, how do you make it emit rays in the direction of the camera pointing? Yeah, no worries. All right, let me make a thing here. Scale it up. Uh, add a bunch of subdivisions. That's probably fine. Um, and let's just duplicate this in the X as well. Alrighty then. Let's add a camera. So 
something like this. So we're clearly looking across it. Um, and I also want to add, uh, let's just throw in some additional geometry so that we have, hopefully, I'm not, I've not tried occlusion culling in Blender. Um, so we're going to learn together. What you're interested in is uh, deleting points, right? So geometry, delete geometry. We're interested in deleting points of our geometry, which means we're interested in the points of our geometry. Uh, if we bring in our camera, because we need to know the location of it. There we go. And we need to know the position of our points. The direction is going to be the position of the points to the camera. Right. I'm not sure if it's going to be this way or the opposite, but we'll find out in a sec. Raycast is going to come on here. This is our target geometry. Not quite. Oh yeah, I kind of see what you mean, I see. Um, right, I need a vertex. So I'm just using my vertex node, but it's just a line with one point. Like that, like this, like that, and then like this. Does that work? No. <laughs> uh, the target mesh must have faces. Okay, so we're going in this direction, but then it's going to not read correctly. Because then it's shooting at itself. Unless the source location is the location of the camera. Nah, you don't need a plane. You should just be able to use the source location as the point. Um, but it's just whether or not we have a... Nah, I really, I honestly, I don't think you need a count. I don't think you need a position because you can just set. I mean, you, you're using the thing as the position, right? We're just drawing lines, essentially. Right, let's use the Raycast Plus so that we can actually visualize this. Um, so we're going to come through here, plug this in like this. This is our, this is also our. Target geometry. Ray direction, source position. How is that the only way though? Because you're not trying to hit the camera. Weird. I don't know. Well, if that's the case, then you just do exactly the same as we've just done, but pointing like the ray direction is towards the camera. The uh, the target geometry is this plane or whatever, like I'll just do an icosphere, uh, which is positioned on the camera, right? Right, so there's our camera with our icosphere on it. That's fine. That can just be tiny, and then uh, the 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 this is now shooting rays out in each direction. But I think each ray still hits, doesn't it? Um, can you explain what the source position is? That is the start of the ray. <clears throat> so at the moment we're setting the source position as the vertices. Um, of the surface. Now we can see that we have this normal direction coming back off our uh, our preview there, right? So everything is basically every point on our geometry is being cast at our target, which is the icosphere. And if it and yeah, so that's <laughs> that's basically that. That's how it works. Um, 
Yeah, so if this now is hit, then delete it, is that right? Uh, geometry. Oh wait, sorry, if it's not a hit, then delete it. So do that, do that. But we've got some occlusion, which is, there should be occlusion, but that's not working there. Um, utility boolean, not, right? Yeah, but Riaz, every single ray coming out of the camera is going to hit the icosphere here. It doesn't matter if it's a plane here or if it's a ball here. Like, it's going to hit. In fact, this one is bigger relatively than that. Like, but what I'm curious about is why that there's no occlusion. You know, this is still passing through itself, right? So in my head, this ray should hit here and then it's like well i haven't hit it because that's um cause, well that's the thing um is there any way we can make the camera shoot the rays and see what points it hits uh there should be yeah if you do that and then that then we can see that all of our lines are shooting out in that direction but it's not like every you don't have the you don't have as many rays right if i do that then we can see that there's a lot of points but does this still work then plane is at the start of the camera where the rectangle is. No, it really has, the issue is the occlusion. The occlusion. <laughs> it's, it's really nothing to do with the camera. The issue is that the rays go through the similar object, right? If you have something like this, the ray is going to go straight through. We need to know where the ray is like not going through itself. As far as I'm aware, there's no way to do self-intersecting, like a calculation for self-intersecting. But you can calculate the distance between the position of the camera and the points and plug it into the max distance. I'm literally like so lost at this point, but anyway. Yeah. All right. Uh, hit positions. I wonder if you could do it in reverse. You could find the hit positions, then you could find the nearest um, can we transfer that attribute transfer attribute from the from this to the hit position max distance of the ray cast. Oh, so you're deleting them basically based on... Wait, no, that doesn't work. You would need two raycasts. Because otherwise it's like the hit distance into here. I might not be following. I'm only like half eyes on the chat. Um, anyway. I, why are you using raycast for your uh, your camera culling? It's so much easier to use gradients because you can just take your camera and basically do what we've done here, subtract, and then this is your um, gradient texture factor. And you just set this to radial, and then you can map range this, and then you're done. Um, so that's. Yeah, Riaz, exactly. Uh, so the vector rotates 
root to set this to Euler. And then you just plug in your rotation to the rotation. And then you're done. I think you have to invert it as well. But now you can just say like, okay, well, let's, this is can be map ranged. And then you can do a compare equals on that. And that's your culling. For frustrum culling, at least, it's super simple. All right. Let's go back to here. We probably just... Uh, we want to set some locations for this to work. Let's use a Musgrave. Oh, it's going so slow. Gradient had time work. Because you're essentially, from the camera position, right? You're essentially saying, I want this range to be in view, right? So if you have a, a radial gradient, you can basically just say, like, okay, well, from this angle to this angle. Uh, yeah, camera call was my first note. It's super simple. Let's have a look at, I think actually window coordinates, I do it even simpler. I need to update it for, um, where is it, mapping? Window coordinates. So it's literally, take the camera position, subtracted from the position position, do the rotation. I'm doing a manual radial gradient, but that's all this is doing. Um, there's also a bit of stuff going on for the aspect ratio and the resolution, but you kind of have to do that because we don't have the uh, the way it comes in, and then I'm literally map, and then it's there. There we go. That's it. <laughs> There's literally all there is to it. It's super easy. Uh, right. Let's set this scale down a little bit. I want patches. We also need to make sure the patches are not on vertical surfaces for our snow. Uh, Point doppelganger. Uh, you could do it with, that's why the source position you can use. Um, so you could literally add like a little, scale the normal down and then add that to the position and then use that as your source position. Okay, that's a little bit better. Um, Let's just have a look at the output of this. Yeah, camera information would be super useful. Ah, oh, there we go, that's actually changing it a bit now. I feel like something weird is going on with this. Let's, uh, <laughs> how many math notes gives you goosebumps? I could show you how it works with shaders really, real quick, actually. Because at least we can visualize it that way. Um, let me make, I'm just going to add a plane. I'm going to duplicate it. I'm going to duplicate it and move it in there. The other way, there we go. Scale this up, all right. Let's add a camera. So the reason I've done this is so that we have visualizations for each axis. And we can come in here. I need to bring in an object info node. Um, wait, that doesn't actually quite work the same. Um, let's just build it nice and easy. So object info does not work. We need texture coordinate node. I'm going to grab the camera. Uh, we're going to grab the position, which is kind of actually already worked out. Um, if you have a node, you can put it inside the node group. Copying and pasting drivers doesn't actually work across duplication, right? If I have a value node, and I put in hash frame in here. Can I type frame? Uh, let's try that again. All right, and then I duplicate this. The one that's duplicated has no driver. So, and it doesn't work with like importing as well. I found it's just like not really very useful. <clears throat> so, I literally just want the position of the object. Uh, 
so that I can help <laughs> help explain what's going on. Uh, geometry precision. Oh right, yeah, I'm being dumb. Um, what's wrong with the thumbnail? There's nothing. Nothing wrong with the thumbnail. Um, how do I get the position of something? I've like completely forgotten how this works. Um, view actor. Terrible. All right, I'm just going to use I'm just going to use drivers. Um, so I need my location and I need my rotation. Combine X, Y, Z. So Control Alt C. Oh, that's not working. Um, I expect a number. I hate, hate how Blender does this. It's like, oh, this isn't a number. This has letters in it. It's like, come on. Don't be stupid. Just let me paste in something which is clearly like you've put the letter there. Very annoying. Oh, and I was supposed to be doing this as drivers anyway. Um, copy his new driver. Method only works if the object has no rotation on a scale of one. Yeah. Yeah, I was just being stupid. Um, like, seriously, having difficulty. Copy his new driver. Let's just delete that driver. Paste that driver. Okay, so it's not live updating. Acceptable. On paste driver. Copy his new driver. Paste driver. And we want our rotation as well. So copy his new driver. Paste driver. Alright, so obviously you wouldn't have to do this in geometry nodes because geometry nodes is better than shaders. But uh, this is how it's just for the sake of making sure that we are all in the same page about what's going on. All right. So if I now move around, is this going to... There we go, cool. And if I rotate... Is this not a day? Okay, that's fine. Cool, so we have our location and our rotation. camera pause and cam rotation. So you can do your subtract thing and right, and this is going to give you the position and then you can do your vector rotate, which is going to set this to Euler rotation. There we go. Right. Oh yeah. And then you have to invert it. So now we have, I know there's a way to get this immediately in shaders, but because we're talking about geometry nodes, right? So this is important that you're doing it this way and we're doing it from our position as well. All right, so now we have the center of the camera. We can see this at the center because it's like, it's where everything converges, right? So now we can grab a gradient. Uh, let's just do this with a gradient texture for ease and convenience. Yeah, the object info node. I mean, shaders really just need to be like brought up to parallel with geometry nodes, but that's like a whole job for somebody. So I understand why not as well. Um, all right. Oh, that's 
Thanks, Nikolai. Glad it's providing some value. Um, I was going to use the radial gradient, but then you'd also have to rotate it. So I'm just going to show you the I'm going to show you the math way. It's pretty easy. Separate x, y, z, and then you need a math node. Right. Set this to octan two. Do something like this. Right. So x and y will give you a radial gradient. What we're actually interested in is x and z which is going to give us a radial gradient um, if we look down here, right? Um, and then we are just going to do like the compare, which is like math, the, the blender version of if equals, right? So you can see now I'm doing this, right? You would work this out with math based on the um, the aspect ratio of your camera, right? But there we go. So this is our X framing. And then we're going to do basically another one of these, but with Y instead of that, right? And then in this view, we can see that this is, actually I have a square camera, so this is fine. Doing that. And then you just multiply these two together, right? Multiply like that. And now suddenly, we've got a really nice, convenient view, right? So this is basically what I do in geometry nodes. It's obviously frustrum culling because it's based on the frustrum rather than the hit, but yeah, that's how I would do it with gradients, just using arctan too, and some compare nodes. Nice and simple. It's literally, that's all it is. Um, uh, Nathan Rosendahl. Talking about getting different node systems up to the same level, I'm adding the scene time node from geometry nodes to the compositor as your first Blender contribution. Wow, very valuable Blender contribution as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Um, again, Jin, uh, what's your opinion about the attribute viewer? You made one and you thought people need it, but I don't know. I think people, I think the only reason that people might not look like they need it is because, um, is because a lot of people are just not working that com with that level of complexity in Blender, but the people who are or at least, sorry, in geometry nodes, but the people who are really do need things like attribute viewers because currently the spreadsheet is so difficult to get anything out of. Um, the full scene, do you mean the, our snowy one? Our, there we go. Oh, we got it in the corner. So this is what we've been working on today. <laughs> yeah, Mohammed, exactly. Um, yeah, I think we just need more people to actually, I, I think a lot of people just don't realize that they can work in geometry nodes yet, you know, like it's, there's a lot that, it, that people haven't really dived into yet. I think we just need more. Oh, I'm at my shoulder. Oh, smart word. No worries. To be fair, it was Gabe who t told me to use, because I was working it out like that as well, like I was doing such a complex bit of maths. Gabe sent me a message like, you know, you can just make a cone on the camera. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so simple. Um, all right. So I need to, let's finish up this now. Let's finish up this now and I can get some dinner. Um, yeah, feel free to drop any more questions and things in the chat, because otherwise I'm just gonna, you know, tick on with what I'm doing. Oh, I could really do with a cup of tea as well. All right, so, 
we need hey nugget how's it going we need a normal mask which obviously i'm just going to use my toolkit linked in the description i hate promoting stuff but it's uh toolkit's actually really good and there's going to be more being added to it real soon as well there's um yeah yeah more to be added uh yeah this is the parallax it's the same you've seen it before actually this one you like literally this texture i just appended it from the original scene they're pretty fun this wasn't actually originally what i was planning on using it for but uh no, i don't know it's come out it's come out nice uh boolean maths oh man these like 3000 millisecond compute times it's like 0.5 so that we're just on the top surfaces and we're going to grab a little bit bigger on our musgrave i wish there was an easier way to visualize these textures without them needing to go onto their shaders uh, onto the um yeah onto the geometry like oh i just want to view this on a do you know what i can i can view it on a plane let's um let's make something which is 20 by 40. that's about the right size isn't it Um, oh gee, there we go. <laughs> Using in the video. There's a we're making. I say we. There's a a really generous. Uh, and I'm super grateful to him. Guy sent me an email and was like, "Hey, I have done documentation in the past. Do you want me to help out with the ETK documentation?" Um, so we've actually got like documentation in the works which is very exciting. So soon there will be like documentation that you can use online, kind of like search documentation. Um, but yeah, Chip, could you create a bolt and nut in geometry nodes using displacement for offsetting threads and the opposing parts offset? Um, yeah, actually, let me show you something because I've already done that. Uh, oops. Control O, don't save. Um, Geonodes fields, nut test. Yeah, after our last chat, I was like, let me go and see if I can make a nut and bolt. Uh, I didn't actually make the bolt. This is just a nut, obviously. But uh, this is pretty straightforward. I mean, obviously, so you're saying that you want to have offsetting is needed because of shrinkage. So, um, I mean, I don't really know what you mean by shrinkage. <laughs> I think it's like the the thread size, right? You don't want it to bind because your your nut needs to be a little bit bigger. I mean, you could literally just like scale these things up, or you could offset them along their normals. At this point, um, now the issue is here that I'm using bevels because there's no bevel node. So without the bevels, it looks like this. I mean, obviously, still perfectly viable topology, but um, yeah, if you want to bevel it, then then there we go. And then I'm also doing weighted normals just for shading, but obviously that's not going to take any. It's not going to be of any value for your three D printing. Yeah, so the nut needs to be a bit bigger. So you could just uh, you could either scale it in general or you could just scale it along normals <clears throat> excuse me um does this node scale along normals yeah sure it does <laughs> point one something like that uh, i guess we'd actually want to go like the opposite right um So there we go, that 
just pulls it in a little bit just to make the, the void a bit bigger. I guess, um, I mean, you could always just literally have it so that the, because obviously everything's parametric, right? So it's, we, the process is very simple. We have an object which is generating a cylinder. Let me just get rid of these bevels again. And then we're, we're using a Boolean, which I know is uh, debatable if it's a good idea, but uh, I'm also using these cones as bevels because again, we don't have the bevel modifier, right? But essentially we're just taking our cylinder and we're cutting out a, a cylinder inside it. And then we're cutting out a thread. So I guess if you were wanting to have like that fine control over being like, okay, I want to have this much tolerance within the thread and I want to have this much tolerance within the overall shape, then it would simply be a case of making your cylinder cutter bigger and your thread cutter bigger. Um, yeah. And obviously as soon as we get bevels, then uh, we can have more of a conversation about like what sorts of things are actually valuable in 3D printing because then we can start building these tools with that in mind because then it can just be like a tick box for somebody or they can be like nut with bolt separately oh my god booleans yeah i know nobody likes booleans i wonder why such awful things but yeah so at the moment you can make these things with bevels separate bevels but until we get a proper bevel they are still um, it's just not like it's not a great process having to use separate modifiers if you're trying to make like an easy to use tool uh, yeah you might have to try a slightly faster method good luck good luck getting it to work my shoulder it feels like it's going to dislocate i think that's one of the problems with standing up for a few hours like this is i put too much weight on my shoulders okay so what i'm doing here is i'm just trying to debug the scale of my musgrave that actually doesn't look too bad um, but i do want to change the uh, the level we're going from. There's fewer holes. Although I kind of want more holes on the surface of the lake, so that would be at a certain z height. Um, <laughs> Riaz, thanks. I probably won't go through on this stream, by the way. I'm just trying to like chop through this now. Um, the yeah. All right. So I'm going to go custom Z on here, so we're going to map range, um, is this a zero? I think it actually is a zero, isn't it? Yeah, perfectly at zero, which means that we can use the absolute Z. So we're going to go with absolute, separate, we're going with the Z, and then this is coming off the position. and something like that, all right. Uh, yeah, you can use 3.1. 3.1 is gonna come out soon anyway, so it's fine. <clears throat> so less on the ice, that's fine. It becomes like zero to point two or something like that. Okay. Um, point oh one. Have I always been this? Have me? Have I always been this good at maths? I don't really think I am very good at maths. But thank you for saying that's kind. Um, Uh, he, I guess, I guess, <laughs> um, 
I've always been able to like see maths fairly, um, fairly like with, I don't know, with like some level of clarity, I suppose, I've been able to think about really simple arithmetic problems, um, but absolutely not like when it comes to abstract maths, I'm dumb as anything when it comes to abstract stuff. I just can't really get my head around it. Uh, not test for you. And for Riaz as well. Not test, there we go. Uh, Riaz, I've just sent it to you as well. And to check. All right. Uh, how soon is soon for 3.1? Does anybody actually know when 3.1 is coming out? I saw about the up uh, the, the the shift to Beacon 2. Um, I feel like surely it must be in like February or something. Like it must be pretty soon. Um, right. Let's view these points. <laughs> Quaternions and imaginary numbers. It's honestly, it's such nonsense, I swear. I just don't, don't get it at all. Come on. <laughs> Arctan too. Um, I only know these things because Blender teaches them to me. Uh, Riaz, I mean when it goes to master, like when it's, when it becomes, when it becomes Blender. Let's grab this plane, I need to uh, subdivide it so I've actually got enough topology here. Kind of a simple. Oh, my computer is complaining. Takes them to six. That should be more than enough. Um, so bad with maths. <laughs> You'll get there, don't worry. Um, so at Zero. Oh wait, so lower numbers is more, right? So if I said this is zero, I want less snow on the ice. Yeah, I'm the same as Alex, it's not good. But like I know I don't know how trig works. Like I couldn't give you a proof on it, but I I do know how it looks <laughs> and, and that means that I can use it um, because you know I don't like I don't know how an icosphere is made I don't know how the clutch system in a car works but I can still use the clutch I still know when to use it it's exactly the same uh, what's the plugin for the no timings it's just blender 3.1 it's a default feature turn on timings in the node editor overlays All right, I'm just reducing the amount of points on the ice. At least I will be when it updates. Oh. Oh, maybe I didn't even click on it. I was thinking it was taking too long. Um, let's try again. A little bit more. There we go. And I'll just bring these ones down. For the actual land. There we go. I want it to be mostly snow covered. Let's maybe bring up our scale to one. All right. And then coming along here, volume to mesh. Nice. All right, so we, our radius wants to come right down, like 0.1. Right, 
right now it's way too blobby. That's a bit better, obviously way too low, way too low resolution. I want this to be around about five times more. Let's just go up to double for now. Um, maybe a little bit more. Things just get super heavy when you do this. That's this kind of the problem with wanting to do it live. Is it's like, oh, it just seems like so many. Um, there's like so much for it to compute all the time, rather than it just doing this calculation once at the end of the process. And this is like really striated, like, I don't know. Let's go back down to 1000. I don't want to get these like contour lines quite so extremely. I also don't want this quite so much there. Let's go down to 0.3. Darren, thanks for the stream, no worries, man. You take care as well. Thanks for tuning in and uh, thanks for participating. All right. I kind of want to have the voxel amount actually controlled by our Musgrave because right now, sorry, not the voxel amount, the radius. Because right now, this is all very uniform like and i want it to be much more lumpy in the middle so where are we even coming in from yeah we'll just plug in and see what happens it would also be cool if i could like cache everything that happened before that would be nice so we're going from 0 to 0.2. That seems pretty good, actually. I might start at 0 0.1. Go up to 0 0.3. I'm not really sure how this is going to look, but... There we go. It's kind of... It's a bit better. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Um, anything we want to do to this? Displacement. Try and, like, disguise some of that. Uh, those level changes. Maybe to see adaptivity, is this going to help us or is this going to make it worse? That's a bit better, actually. How would I randomize text for instances? Um, that's a good question. Let's have a look. There's only really like assigning the material left for us to do here, so we can come back and finish the snow in a moment. Um, how would I randomize text? You have a grid of keys. What do you mean by keys? Um, let's get rid of that actually. So text, uh, string to curves. There is a way, I I wonder if, well, is there a way, actually? Um, I've definitely seen people doing like random number, so random letter searching. Um, I really want to like assign this to a letter. Maybe I'm not clever enough to do this, actually. Hmm. Oh, keys on a keyboard. Thanks for the stream. Do you have any experience in combining GIS, and GIS data and geometry nodes? I do not, unfortunately. Um, although there is like a Blender GIS importer thing. Um, so that's probably a good way of at least bringing data into Blender. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure about even what data gets combined. 
Um, so. Random character on each of them. I kind of feel like you want to make a base, basically a bunch of those letters A, B, C, D, F, G, whatever. Um, how do you get random displacement on instances? You realize the instances. Because if, if they are instances, the idea is that Blender is saving memory by making identical objects, right? So, uh, right, yeah, slice string only has a single value. So what I'm thinking is we go um, instance on points, let's grab a grid mesh. Okay, so the problem right now is that these are all just they're all over the shop. So I need to find the location for each one, like the X offset for the minimum. Is that what I want? <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, attribute statistic. Let's try this. I, I believe these are curves, so we'll go with splines. Um, Oh, this doesn't output fields. It's a node. I have no idea why the attribute statistic is not a field node. Right, well. Let's have a look at what this is actually doing. So we have a bunch of instances with There we go, with different positions. Can I just subtract the position from their positions? I know that sounds like a strange thing to do, but can I do that? Back to math, scale minus one. Yes, I can. And that means that we can now have a grid of letters and we can randomize which ones of these letters get shown and then we can just do like a fill curve or whatever or curve to mesh using a line not mesh line a curve line and we also need to realize instances and fill curves that doesn't really work either. Oh, you get the idea. Um, I guess really fill curve is probably what you want. So is this something that would work for you, um, Owen? Sorry, it's so messy. So you've got your points basically and then your you just have a selection of in this case letters i'm just using between a and g because you said keyboard oh wait do you mean like oh keys on a keyboard like a, a grid keyboard right like a computer keyboard um There we go, something like this. Bit bigger, a few more points in here. There we go, oh, that's nice, it works. Yeah, anyway, hopefully that's, hopefully that works for you. <laughs> it's the, It works basically because these, the string to curve outputs in each curve, each letter is an instance, right? So you can just do this. Um, Um, with particle systems and shader nodes, object random. Wait, 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 wait. Um, with the 
object random thingy in the back to Um, yeah, so the way that Geometry Nodes is working is it's processing every instance the same. So you can still do it with shaders if you want to do shader based displacement. Sorry. Like subsisting on Christmas chocolates. Um, so, yeah. You can still do all of your random per instance with shaders because cycles is doing it like per pixel versus geometry nodes which is like doing it per object id i guess all right um let's just grab a smooth and snow shader oh have we lost the smooth snow shader because we rebooted or oh, restarted blender Quite probably. Oh no, it's still here. Okay. For it to work with real displacement, um, I think we need to remesh it. What am I working on now? I'm finishing, <laughs> hopefully, anyway, finishing this uh, snowy scene. It's like not awful, awful, but it's not good. Um, yeah, we definitely need more topology. Let's just go ahead and remesh it. Um, oh, not screw. That's the worst thing to click. I have way too many polys for a screw. Come on, Blender. Remesh, that's what we're after. Our system is out of GPU memory. Nice. Just save and voxel size. Oh wait, maybe we just do an adaptive subdiv. That would be fine, wouldn't it? Thanks, Owen. It's um, it's a thing. <laughs> I need to actually like start designing my streams a bit better. Today was just like a, I don't know. This week's just been a bit nuts. So I was just like, I I literally chose last night while I was making the thumbnail. I was like, okay. Let's just do a, a winter scene. Come on, subdivision surface. Oh. So, how's everybody doing? Has anybody been working on anything they want to share? Feel free to, um, if you want to like send me stuff on Discord, I can bring it up on stream. Taking a moment, isn't it? We'll get there. All right. Uh, if you're interested in uh, photogrammetry, the Creative Shrimp, Gleb Alessandrov, and AD Burrows have started a Creative Shrimp uh, Discord server. So. Definitely go check that out because um, they they've got their new photogrammetry course, and um, yeah, so everybody's just like talking about photogrammetry, showing their photogrammetry. Here's one that I did. This is like an old one. I used to do a lot of shoes, or I had a I had a bout of doing loads of shoes because I was working for an interior design firm and we were designing shoe shops, so. I had to like, I had to scan some shoes. Um, 
All right, Noah. Just been sort of tinkering with nodes and had failed projects. No, that's good. Failed projects is like a real good way to push yourself. Uh, push yourself getting through things. Um, and yeah, just like generally picking stuff up and seeing where it goes. Uh, working on some more world shader stuff for your geo, uh, geo sim stuff. That is a really good add on. Um, working on a node that turns a mesh into an SDF. That's very cool. Uh, the Geonos to UE5 add on. Yeah. Uh, Ultimesh. Yeah, it seems really good actually. From what I can, <laughs> from my not trying it. No, but like, I, th I think um, basically it converts geometry nodes into a blueprint. That's how it works. And then it, you know, it live updates. So that does seem like a really good, um, a really good tool. Yeah, I'm really interested in trying it out as well. I really want to test out a little bit more Geono, uh, Unreal Engine this year. I think I've got some projects that might be a fun diversion for doing that. Yeah. Currently, it seems like something that I will have to do over summer, though, because... Um, Phonics, what software did you use? Did you try Meshroom? I was using Meshroom to begin with, with my shoe scans, and... Um, yeah, it was just... It was very slow, and it was giving me a lot of holes. Um, and I'm not, like, I don't know enough about photogrammetry to actually be able to, n to to not have that. Like, I need the, at least at the time I was doing it, right, I had no resources. The photogrammetry course now is amazing because I've learned, like, just so much more. Even just, like, about camera handling. Because, um, yeah, there's loads of stuff about, obviously, making sure that your camera is taking consistent photos. Um... But yeah, I ended up using one called Zephyr 3D, which nobody ever seems to use from what I can tell, but it did a really good job fairly quickly with default settings. And that was, that's what I wanted. Something that I could just like click and forget. It was still taking like an hour to process each each scan. But, um, but yeah, that was faster than Meshroom was doing it. All right. System is out of GPU memory. All right. Looks like we're going to be using CPU. That's not fun. Um, but that's fine. That's fine. Uh, before we do, before we do that. Let's see if we can work out our world shader a little bit better. Um, and then we'll see how this goes. All right, I don't really like the framing, so I'm just gonna move the camera a little bit. like this I can't even see the rock stacks we've made which is fine it's fine it's not like we spent any time on those uh, let's grab our our world here might want to use the sky text to know we've actually got some stuff in uh, Zephyr Z-E-P-H Y R I think oh wait maybe that's what you wrote uh, Zephyr 3D. It wasn't free. Oh, sorry. 3DF Zephyr. This one. 3D Flow. Yeah, it was good. I don't know. It was, it was good. But I believe it's a paid thing. Yeah. I had the free... Well, I had Zephyr Lite for like a week. Um it's like free for a week right free trial 
seems seems good. And it had a bunch of stuff in it for like clean up as well, so that was good. Um, yeah, streams like this. So I think I, I would like to use these streams to like, I don't know, do a little bit more like personal project stuff, I guess. Let's, um, I don't know, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm not really sure what's going to go on, like really what's happening for the next year. I think I might just, because there's loads of projects which I've got like earmarked um, and we'll just have to see how they go really. This sky texture is always so bright. Um. There we go. Maybe try a few of these. Uh, these winter ones. I've got a couple of these actually. Um, this is Winter River. Let's grab Winter Lake instead, maybe. Bit too diffused. Maybe something like this. I don't know. Yeah, so many ideas, so little time. It is the way. It, I swear it gets worse and worse as well. <laughs> like, the older you get, the more you're like, oh, that would be a really nice thing. And I guess you get like a back catalogue as well of things that you're like, oh, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that. And after a while, it's just like, yeah. Yeah, you're probably not going to, probably not going to do it. All right, let's, uh, let's maybe set this to two pixel dicing for the snow see if we can get this to work I don't want to go to CPU rendering because that is slow as hell but we'll see if we can turn this on might just say no <laughs> no ideas in too little time too much time there's a I'd recommend just um reading reading books reading academic papers uh, if you're at university as well you'll have access to like all of the academic papers um, wait did that actually just render oh no it's still going um, yeah reading papers I read just it's so I, I remember this happened at, like I think this was like my aha moment when I was writing my dissertation um, because I was like so uninspired by it. I was just like, oh God, this chore. I've got to write loads of stuff and I hate it. And then, uh, and then I was just like, right, okay, well, I'm, I'm just going to start reading stuff. Like just start reading stuff. And then after like five or six papers, just like skimming through like the summaries, it was like, oh, do you know what I should, I should like, let me just use this search term instead and have a look at like a bunch of papers on this thing. And then you're finding like all of these different things and all of these different authors. And it's like, it's so difficult sometimes, especially like if you're in a cycle of finding it difficult to come up with stuff. And then if you, just, you know, like reading is such a like easy way to pull you into inspiration because I think like as humans, we basically pick up on other people's inspiration. So somebody who's written a book or an academic paper you sort of uh, just go ahead and adopt that. Right, CPU compute. Let's hope this doesn't just, you might just hear my computer try and take off with the fans. Let's see how much RAM we use for this. Um.
There we go. So maybe while this is happening, maybe we can have a look on Science Direct. I don't know if I can still sign into it actually. Um, Science Direct. It's been a very long time since I've had a <laughs> university login. Let me try and log in off screen. Here we go. Uh, let's see if it's going to accept this. I definitely don't still have. Oh no, don't make me register. Come on. Fire your institution. Oh, this seems fine. It's only using 35 gig. Snow's a bit blobby. I'm not a huge fan, but it's it's snow. And it feels kind of wintry. That's kind of the vibe we're going over, going after. Um, oh no. Okay, it looks like I don't have a a university email address anymore. Um, but yeah. All right. Um, there we go, it's kind of worked. Also, um, inspiration. Uh, gets inspiration like you the more you work on stuff that you only need one bit of inspiration right to start working and then as you're working you'll find like you get one more and then five more and then ten more and then like suddenly by the end of doing a project you've got like hundreds of ideas that you want to work on and it's like i don't know there's just like so much there's just so much uh like every one bit of input will give you so many more bits of output. Um, but yeah, there we go. So, I think this is, this is like the end. This is, <laughs> this is the end of this stream. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, I'm going to be doing these every week. I know we've had a break because it was like, it was literally Christmas Day, and then it was New Year's Day, so, yeah. I'm going to be starting doing these every week again, so it's going to be every Saturday at 4pm GMT. Um, I'll try and have a more nody idea next time, or maybe, I don't know, it's up to you. Like, do you want to see more stuff which is, like, really strictly nodes, or do you want to see more stuff which is, like, project based and is more about workflow um uh, oh and yes that's correct also for the bump map the distance on the bump node is in meters so you're going to need to change the bump height to like 0 0.01 and then just control it with the strength um but yeah yeah starting work is always the hardest part uh, once you're going with it it's fairly easy to just like roll through and as well like even so I, like, I've been drawing recently and I'm trying to like trying to learn how to do that again and it's like it's so easy to be like okay I'm just going to try this for like I don't know half an hour and then you get like four hours in and sure it might not be great but you've spent four hours doing something and like that's that's not unvaluable, even if you haven't come out with anything that you like, that you're proud of. It's all like building a skill, building uh, comfort with a tool set. So, so the workflow, like project-based workflow stuff, cool. That makes it easier for me because I have hundreds of things I want to try and make as just like scenes, environments, places. One of the projects I want to work on is just like it's basically world building, right? So it's um, it's this guy's journey across a continent. Um, it's kind of like based in 
like northern Europe, but like not not real world. Uh, but those kinds of environments, and maybe like a little bit of like North America, the idea of being like super early settlers, and kind of navigating those environments when they're like super bleak, and even the roads are super unmade up. So there's a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> your bump map just turns the whole material black. Have you plugged your bump map into the normal socket of the bump node, or have you plugged it into the uh, the height? Let me just, let me save this. I'll probably render it later or something for a, for a post, but. Um, more with ETK as well, sure. Sure, I might do some more, um, I don't know. I don't really, I don't really like doing tutorials on ETK because a lot of people don't have it, <laughs> so. Uh, but maybe some Patreon stuff. I'm going to be doing Patreon courses as well, if people are interested. So like project-based courses. Somebody emailed me about making a brutalist architecture generator and I was like, you know what? That would make a great Patreon course. So we're going to start doing these. My goal is to do two a month. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'll keep to that. Maybe one a month is more realistic. Um, but yeah. This is geometry nodes. What am I doing? Uh, it's a normal dump, and then the height comes into like an image texture, right? So this is, you want it to be like this, right? So super low. Definitely shouldn't be turning your whole material black, that is definitely wrong. That's more like you've plugged it into the normal socket. Um, ah, and this is a Discord. Oh my god, I have so much open. Hey, Lorenzo, welcome back. Oh yeah, it really does. Hmm. Um... Right, maybe, uh, maybe share more, uh, somebody's done an occlusion setup. Cool. Um, what am I looking for? Yeah, have you got more of like a, the rest of the node tree? <laughs> like how this is plugged in or like the base color? I'm so confused how this has happened. It, that should just work. That should just work. Um. <laughs> I'm glad that your friend's expectations have been set high. That's uh, you just make sure you don't disappoint her. <laughs> Uh, is the output node muted? Maybe was that in the screenshot? No, the output node is not muted, but and it's set to all, so that should be fine. That's really weird. Uh, if I can provide words to anybody who needs one, this is from the chat. Uh, from starting point to caption. Oh wait, what? If I can provide words to anyone who needs them from starting point to caption the pick, hit me up. If you feel like you don't have the words, it's probably because I'm keeping them for you. <laughs> um, um, if you just uh, share your, if you just uh, screen, just like screenshot, rather than me jumping into a call. Um, <laughs> thanks. All right, all right. Um, how should this be rendered? Environment needs to be different because it's got to be you, like you got to punch the sky real hard. Um, in terms of like the um the value, like this is way too dim for the sky. Uh, and we're also going to make sure that we have a mist pass 
on our camera. Has Blender crashed or are we still good? Still good. Um, okay, so I'm just going to save this. I should have gone into solid view. Hey, come on. This is something, I mean, even a scene like this is very, um, very, very basic in terms of the amount of stuff on screen. Like, we don't have a huge amount of foliage. Blender can really bog down. All right, let's turn on these overlays. Grab our camera. We need to check our uh, viewport. Mist is what I'm interested in. And we now need to find out our mist ranges, which are actually in the world tab for some reason. Uh, so our mist pass. I'm going to come back basically from the camera to. Actually, for this scene, that's probably about right. We're going to go up to just inside that. The scene lacks a white bunny somewhere. <laughs> that's true. All right, so we have a mist pass. Just need to make sure that we have our mist pass ticked on in here. Um, I would like to do set my film to transparent because that means that I can get a skyless render. Um, so, and we'll have a separate environment. All right. Uh, rendering. This is all fine. Just do like 50 samples. Wait, hit render. Oh, did I just mess up? The answer is yes, because a while ago I set this to render at 4K. And I do not want that to happen. We only want to render 1080 because um, Instagram only renders like 1080 max anyway. So there's no there's no point if you're rendering for I mean for video obviously uh, 1080 is a, is the max that I'm streaming anyway, and Instagram is going to max out at 1080. So there's no point in rendering more pixels than you need. Hopefully, we should be able to do something here. Uh, I was gonna, I was just gonna stop the stream, but I guess a lot of people probably don't see comp work done either. So maybe a little bit of comp now. I'll do it in Affinity Photo because it's easier for me to develop and just generally work with photos. You gladly watch um, Rabbit being made with geometry nodes. I made some origami rabbits actually a couple of days ago because uh, it was my mum's birthday and I couldn't think of a birthday card. So I made, because there's five people in the family, so I made five hair, actually not rabbits, but um, yeah, origami. It's pretty, pretty cute. Um, it would be cool to try and do some like paper style, low poly stuff in Blender with geometry nodes. Oh, updating geometry. It always takes so long. This step of just like getting everything loaded into memory. And we're totally, our current total for memory use is just past 100 gig between the committed to hard drive and the actual RAM. These are. Uh, these adaptive subdivisions can really hit you. It's 105. Getting on for 110. actual folds I reckon you probably could um, to a certain degree 
because as long as it's like a straight fold, some folds that you do in origami, <clears throat> sorry, some some folds that you do in origami are um, very much <laughs> reliant on you like pushing and like tensioning the material, ten like the, not the material, the paper. So sometimes it can be very difficult, I think, to emulate that with paper. Yeah. Um, early mention in you've I had the experience rendering only in 1080p swallows of love detail even if you end up at 1080p it just looks so much better rendered at 4k uh, so the problem that you're probably facing is that your denoising is eating detail so if you render it a higher thing the denoising can be more accurate and then you can downscale um, back down to you know, whatever you're rendering at. So yeah, it is like better to render bigger. So r when people are like, oh, I render 1080p with 4,000 samples, it's like, don't do that. Render it 4K with, uh, like, well, 4K with 1,000 samples would be the same amount of processing. Um, but if you did 4K with like 200 samples, so five times less, but then denoise and scale it down then it's going to be like crisper cleaner image for significant like a fifth of the computation well we're really struggling here 140 gig of memory <laughs> this uh oh i think it's because i yeah i probably should have reduced my subdivision for adaptive subdivisions in the render. I think that's probably what's going wrong here. It would be fine if we actually managed to compute it, but it might give up before then. There we go. Let's, uh, I just don't know if I should cancel it. We're at 97% memory use. I'm surprised the video is still going. Uh, just as a random interlude, the creators of Spershock should start a crowdfunding campaign to rewrite it in C++ or C Sharp. That is very true. Although, um, I don't think, how would it work? You would have to get like a custom build of Blender from them. That was like the Spershock build of Blender. I think what we really need is for custom nodes in Blender. That, so the, the problem with Blender add-ons being really slow is uh, uh, downscaling in post quackles, so it'd have to be done afterwards. Uh, yeah, the, the problem with add-ons in Blender is that they're single-threaded. Like, Python can be really fast, and it can be multi-threaded, and uh, unfortunately Blender developers are or like um add-on developers are limited by having to um sorry i'm just watching my memory go crazy yeah add-on developers are basically limited by um uh by being single threaded. The stream might become a bit choppy. I can see that I have, something just happened with the memory and my CPU is now, oh, we're rendering. We're finally rendering, <laughs> it took a few minutes. Okay, hopefully the stream doesn't crash. At least at my end, it seems to be like pushing all right. We have a hundred percent CPU use. I think I'm just not even going to try and talk while this is happening.
I really hate rendering on CPU. It's so um, it's so slow compared to GPU, and it's also so loud. <laughs> like my GPU never makes noise, and then my CPU fan is so it's like so keen to start. Um, I almost, ma almost, I have 100 gig committed plus 20 gig in use. Um, and I, I'm maxing it out because of the adaptive subdivisions. So even though it's only two, uh, two, two pixels per poly, there's just a lot of geometry. Just a lot of stuff going on. So yeah, I think actually like the whole environment is like adaptive subdivision, or certainly heavy subdivision. Yeah, my poor CPU as well. Come on, we're nearly done, nearly there. Hey, there we go. We survived. The stream didn't crash. And uh, we have something. All right, let me just save these out. Oof. Come on, Blender, please don't crash now. Oh, is it still denoising? What's going on? <clears throat> a powerful computer. Well, it's doing all right. It's not. It's not the fastest. It's a few years old now. Um, but yeah, you'll find because you have swap space, right? So in the memory, your computer will try and put as much onto the hard drive as possible. Um, let's not do any comp in Blender because Blender's come to positive is horrible. Image save as. Um, Oh, I'll just save these as PNGs. Or maybe I, should I save this? Uh, let's try opening XR. I don't want it to be like. I don't want to have to do the LUTs. Uh, winter Wonderland. That'll do us. Right. Um, we need Affinity Photo. And we need live streams. Wait, did I not? Oh, yeah, it's here. Please don't be super dark. Yeah, and that's kind of fine, actually. Um, is it clamped to hell? Ah, we can, we can play with it. So I'm going to remove. Oh, you're joking. Go a separate channel. Um, let me just pick by color. I'm not really sure that alpha was like a separate layer, which I'm like not really a huge fan of. Do you know what? Let's just choose to do with PNGs. It feels like kind of a cop out, but I've still not actually worked out like the proper PN, the proper EXR workflow. Uh, let's just do it this way. Right. Saving that one. We also want to save out the mist because the mist is going to be a lot of our control. I gotta say, this miss pass is broken. What is this?
This is very strange. Uh, Riaz, no worries, see you later. Uh, let's just denoise this to begin with. Like, surely that's just the depth pass. All right, all right. Let's divide the depth pass by 25, I think, or 30. Uh, and then we'll just bring this into the thing. I don't know why the mist pass broke. Like, this is just, this is unusable. So we're going to use the depth, the denoising depth. No, the real depth. Um, and we're just going to, yeah, converter math divide by 20. There we go. Maybe a bit more. Or should we use a, a map range? Your, is there surely there's a map range? There is. But for some reason it's a different kind of node. Uh, from 0 to 30. Because from 0 to 1. There we go, something like that. Cool. Did you at one point use aces? No, I've never used aces. Aces is, uh, aces loses a lot of, um, uh, like the, what is this? Um, yeah, it, it loses a lot of color accuracy actually. Maybe I can do it after this. Let's clamp this. <laughs> this is so weird doing the denoising in this way, but maybe it's fine. I don't know if you even need to denoise. You definitely need to denoise a mist pass because there's a lot of stuff in here which is like just super noisy. Uh, I don't think this is actually making a difference. So let's just save this. We're only going to be using it to like hand paint in some mist anyway. Um, let's go back to PNGs. Winter Wonderland Mist. And I'm also going to do the environment. Or not. Um, because I don't want it to be all black around the outside. So what I'm going to do instead. Do you know it's after the map range? Yeah. Um, instead of doing all of this, I'm going to disable everything. And then I'm going to save and then re-render so it's useful having everything in uh in categories because it means i can do this very quickly save us i mean it's just blue in the sky why would it lose color accuracy because the uh the way it handles basically the way it handles color to make the color look more realistic uh all different ways that you process color is like inaccurate but it's just it chooses which way you're going to be inaccurate. Um, Aces gives you like a really punchy, clean, sharp, bright way of exposing stuff, which is really great if you want to make stuff look really sunny. Um, but yeah, like the gamut is, I think it's got like holes in it, or not necessarily holes, but like, yeah, there, uh, I think Troy was talking about it on Twitter and uh, I don't know, I trust Troy when it comes to color. He's working on Filmic. So, uh, environment, save this one as PNG. All right, save that, minimize. So, Winter Wonderland comes in, mist and environment. Bring these in, all right, environment can go to the back the this one we're going to develop it first so this is kind of how i always do it uh take a main plate and then we're just going to basically try and get our whites up on our histogram uh, so i'm going to basically work between the brightness and the exposure thing so we're going to expose it a bit more we're also going to bring in the black point a little bit more try and like bring it down a bit You've got to be careful how much you want to expose out your whites. Um, but yeah, 
we can play that contrast as well. Let's kind of extrude. You can kind of see on the histogram like what's different, what different things do. Um, and yeah, it's just playing with it until you find something that is. You can literally just like scroll through each one and be like, does this look better or worse? Just like A/B testing. Trying to find if you want more saturation, less saturation, the warmth. So you can use dark table for this as well, but the next stage you kind of can't use dark table for. Now I'm not too worried about like crushing these blacks because we're going to have our mist pass as well work on it. Um, got a white balance. So I want it to feel like cool blue. And I am literally just like sliding these from side to side to give myself like to check my eye and be like, okay, which one, which one? And actually another thing which you can do, let me just cancel these, right, is you can duplicate your layer. So I'm just pressing control J to do that. And what this means is that I can develop one of them to like what I believe looks good while I'm developing it. And then when you're done, you'll probably find that you've done it like twice as strong as you should have done. So it means that I can just like reduce the opacity of the one that I've, uh, that I've edited. Right. So let's pull this up, bring down those darks. Gonna leave the contrast pretty neutral. I'm using the clarity, which is like localized contrast. So that's allowing me to pull back some of these details. Um, you can also do detail refinement, which is like an unsharp mask in Photoshop. But uh, yeah, we're going to split tone as well, because I want the shadows to be really blue. So I'm going to bring up the saturation a little bit. Gotta make sure that we're not losing too much of that, the white off the top. There we go. Uh, shadows and highlights. You can always use this to like push and pull. That's kind of the way that everything is. It's just like, let's just massage this into the the thing that is like that sits right with our kind of artistic eye. This is Affinity Photo. It's like Photoshop, but without a subscription, <laughs> which is really nice. Uh, I think they're a UK company as well. Always like to you know support local. Uh, I don't need to do anything with the lens. We have detail refinement and noise reduction. Honestly, noise reduction here is sometimes better. Like I, if I have volumes, I'll do noise reduction in here because uh, it's just a little bit easier. So I'm gonna come into somewhere where we have a little bit of detail, some of these things. And I'm gonna set my amount really high. I'm gonna start playing with my radius until we see that really like over sharpened look. Um, somewhere like this, right? So it should look like a really bad phone photo, like a cell phone photo. All right, somewhere in that. So it's like half a pixel refinement. And now we can just like play with this. Something low, like five, 10 percent is really more than enough. Uh, you can do noise reduction. You can do noise addition if you want to like add some noise in here. Make it look a bit more like a photo. I'm not going to do that. We're going to do tones. We're going to do split toning. We could also do a little bit of curve work. So you can always just like a kind of common way is to like S curve. Well, I'm not like that though. Um, but in this case, we've already done like our levels are fairly level, so I'm going to leave it as is. Um, split toning. I'm going to make sure that my shadows are like blue as hell, and then I'm going to make sure that my 
highlights are kind of orangey, right? And then I'm going to work out where my balance point is. And then I'm going to turn these back, right? Basically back to zero. So I don't think I need really much saturation. Really the saturation on my highlights is just neutralizing the blue that we added earlier. And then the I'm just like pulling in some of this blue into the shadow areas as well. So I think actually I might do this stage afterwards because then I can manually paint. I don't think that's doing anything other than losing the saturation on the stone. So I'm going to leave that for now. Um, I know, please, that's fine. So hit develop. Now, because I have both of this like before and after, I can check between them. And if this was too strong, then I can reduce it and be like, okay, actually it should be like 60 60%. I think it was actually fine though, what we went for. So I'm going to leave it full. All right. Ah, no worries. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. Um, right, this mist pass. I'm going to duplicate it. We're going to do two things with it. Uh, we're going to make mist for a start. And secondarily, we're going to make, or oh, I guess first, we're going to gradient map it. So we're going to grab a gradient map, default gradient map. I'm going to delete this inside point. And then we're going to set this to overlay. No, wait, no, we're not. I'm going to make sure this is nested under that level, under that layer. And I'm going to set this layer to overlay, I think. Yeah. And then we can come in here and we can fix up our gradient map. So let's first of all just set everything to white. Or maybe I mean 0.5, because at the moment it's going to punch it up really high. So there we go, half and 50. So there we go, this should be about what we have before. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we are adding some color. So we can add, like, add an emphasis of foreground color in the foreground. Sorry, we can add an emphasis of color, like a tint, to now the foreground and the background separately. So I can come in here and I can say, right, in the foreground, where we have low values, uh, on this left hand one, right, we can now set this to be like blue or whatever, right? We can make it brighter and bluer and just, you know, do something like that. Or we can do the same in the background. We can pick what kind of color we want to have there. Don't worry about the sky, I'll clip this to my background as well. That should be working. Oh wait, maybe these need to be, <laughs> I'm just like stacking things arbitrarily now. Um, I will group these two, is that right? I basically want to avoid it being in the background. Right. Maybe I should just clip it. There we go. I'm just using another layer another copy of the base material, sorry, not material, the base like render to clip as like a clipping layer. So basically it, it takes the opacity from my clipping layer. Um, wait, so let's get back in here. So that orange is like way too vibrant. We're getting like really burnt out origin oranges. I'm going to reduce it. Um, and the foreground as well is like this white is too strong. And you can also do stuff like uh, selectively picking stuff by, um, so this this is our mist pass, right? I can say, okay, I don't want this to appear where my underlying composition has a value range greater than uh, than some amount, right? I just want this to be in the shadow areas. So now I can do this, where I have this control, but I'm still preserving my, my lights here, right?
just send this on for an S curve. Map range was in the composite before it was in shader notes. Is that true? Shameful. It's a weird map range because it's not in with the math node. It's like it's got a purple header. I don't know what that really means in uh, composited terms. No, I think overlay is probably not the right. Um, not the right one for this because that's really like blowing out any, any details we had. Soft light seems to do a bit of a better job. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, we'll stick up with soft light at the moment. I do want to just slightly increase the orange in the background, I think. So, like, because the sun's coming down in that area, right? So I want to make sure that there's a feeling of warmth over there, and then coolness here where we're sat in the shadow. Maybe saturate it a little bit too much as well. And I can bring it back afterwards. And there we go, something like that. Cool, and now I can just use this general like the over overview the overall opacity to now control this there we go something like that and then we can use another one of these to actually like uh, to paint in a bit of um, mist essentially we literally just set it to screen right <laughs> and you're like halfway there already uh, we can use a level adjustment on it to control like you can kind of see that mist disappearing into the background there um, so I'm just going to pull it back slightly and we can set where our mid level is as well just to make sure that we have a bunch of mist at the back and then um, so just going to add some levels to the background here. Um, so you can see, like this is our default sky. That sky is almost dark, right? So I feel like for something like this, we should be able to have an almost white sky like to expose the camera to these shadows. We're oversaturating, so we have to desaturate it a bit, but. the sky should be very nearly black sorry very nearly white do that and control u to give us the let's just make sure we're working in the blue zone as well there we go um bring back our mist now we can just add a mask layer, which is going to allow us to paint in a bunch of mist at the ground level. And it's already going to process its like depth, you know, like the, it's going to be thicker the further away you are. So I can already basically just come in here. I'm using a tablet again. And then uh, I'm just going to invert that mask so it gets rid of it, right? So now it's black. And I'm going to grab a bunch of texture brushes and just essentially paint in with white now onto this level. Are we going to? There we go, X. There we go. 
So now we can start getting a little bit of mist and it's just kind of at the ground level. It's not like too much in too many places, but. There we go. Just lets you have a little bit more control over things. And I will just add a little bit in the sky. stack pop in a little bit better um, and that's fine all right I'm gonna have a final uh, final levels adjustment just so we can like tweak stuff and then you can always add a LUT if you want a specific film look uh, you can like finish your stack with a LUT um, I don't think I actually have any good LUTs in here. Um, let's just load one. Uh, film, look, film looks. So I've just got some like mimic films. You can literally just download these packs from like Gumroad. Just search for LUT packs. Um, and they're just fun to play with just like try out different things basically see what different people have like put together and you're never supposed to use a lot at full <laughs> full opacity um so you know try it and be like would this look right if we like toned it back like if we took the opacity down to like i don't know 20 percent is that an improvement See, this light is like giving us a real punchy blue shadows. So you might want to give it like 10% of that. All right, uh, not my best work, but for a kind of fun and impromptu stream, hopefully this has been of some value to some people. Um, yeah, the accumulate node, if you're interested in the accumulate node, I definitely recommend checking like the early part of the stream when we were looking at that. It's actually super easy to to set up. Um, but yeah. There we go. Alright, and this the snow was super easy to do as well. We just did like points and then points to volume, volume to mesh. Uh, the classic teal and orange, yeah, literally. Um, if it works, don't knock it. Uh, I don't, there we go. But yeah, cool, all right. Thanks everybody for tuning in. I know it's been a few weeks. I'll see you next Saturday. Um, feel free to check requests if you want to, uh, if, you, if there's something specific that you want to know about or that you think would be fun as a demonstration, feel free to just like shoot me a message. Um, yeah, this was fun. I like doing these where it's a bit more kind of easy going. Oh, it's the snow that's super heavy, isn't it? All right. So there we go. Cool. All right. I'm actually going to stop now. Hope everybody is... Uh, well and healthy and uh i will see you i'll see you in a week i mean i'll try and release a tutorial this week as well probably gonna have a look at scatter 5 which is the new scatter from bd3d 
uh, uses geometry nodes, so that's exciting. And the scatter is just like one of those cornerstone uh, add-ons well worth knowing about how to use. Uh, 